Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 50, The Future is Relational, featuring Kitsune Reve. Kitsune Reve is a resident of Alberta, Canada, where she is a nurse and a gardener, among other things. This is her third appearance on the podcast, and it was simply delightful to welcome her back to the show. In our wide-ranging conversation, we covered a lot of topics, including a political scandal in Alberta where local office holders traveled in spite of COVID lockdown, pandemic fatigue, the difference between responding and reacting, the effects of social media on brain function and communication, the end of quote normal, consumption and consumerism, the possibility of famine, the population debate, Kitsune's family heritage in Canada as an example of how lifestyles have changed, the human longing for belonging, how advertising manipulates our beliefs and choices, the poison of mainstream news media, the poor quality of information on the internet, and the importance of following indigenous leadership. We recorded this show six days after the Capitol Hill riot on January 6th, and we refer to it several times during the show before finally talking about it near the end. If you appreciate this episode, please share it on social media. If you're watching it on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. To support this podcast financially, you can make a one-time donation at paypal.me slash colibri or become a member at Patreon at patreon.com slash colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. I love to hear from listeners, so feel free to contact me through radiofreesunroot.com. This intro music is by Dr. Dreamchip of Portland, Oregon. See show notes for how to follow their work. And now, here is my conversation with Kitsune Reve. Strap in, it's over two hours long. YouTube viewers will get a special surprise at the end. Well, what do you want to start off talking about today? Do we want to start off with with current events? (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's the obvious, but I don't know. I've been in a very reflective mode lately i think just Mm -hmm. with the turn of the of the gregorian new year anyways um of course i've been thinking about covid a lot i've been thinking about politics a lot of course with what's going on in your country and we've had a a few things here but nothing like what's going on there it actually i feel uh, quite fortunate to live where i live where our biggest political scandal right now is ministers traveling during the holidays while telling the rest of us to stay home that's wow. causing resignations where right. i am <laughs> so that is that alone is causing turmoil where i am but nothing like where you are that's interesting though to find out how high up are these office holders uh they are provincial for the most part mm-hmm. Um, So our premier in Alberta got in big trouble just after the holidays because right now until at least January 21st, we're in one of the strictest lockdowns in the country where I am. Um, They delayed it. And then from delaying it, we started seeing a big spike in in cases. And then because they delayed it, they had to be really forceful on it when they finally did do it. So we're actually not even allowed to meet people outside. Oh, wow. I know. So if I see my neighbor on the street, it's very much a, hey, how you doing? Can't talk to you. (laughs) Have to keep going. And uh, the goal of it, I think, was to have people not gathering over Christmas. But unfortunately, you know, the rules were explained very clearly to the members of the public. But then it's come out that I think I think they're up to 10 ministers now in our province traveled overseas. Overseas even overseas in some cases to the wow. uk one is one was in greece a few were in vegas there was some in mexico hawaii and um 
they they were not discreet about it like some of them posted things from mexico on their oh, facebook wow. pages uh-huh. yeah well we're all sitting here going i can't see my family for christmas right. unless i live with them really but you're in hawaii like what are you doing you know wow and so they came back and there was people leaving lays outside of their offices <laughs> 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 There was calls for resignation. Um, A couple have resigned. But people are very much blaming the premier saying, you know, because he at first when they came back, he said, I wasn't clear enough with them that they shouldn't be traveling overseas. And for everybody else, we're sitting here going, well, it was pretty clear to me that I shouldn't travel other places. So what do you mean it wasn't clear to a government minister, especially one of the ones who is most involved in the COVID response? Like she's the one, one of the ones who was traveling. She was in Hawaii. Um, She's responsible for the vaccine rollout and all that. And she's saying, oh, I didn't know I shouldn't have traveled. And the worst part about it was when she was asked why she traveled, her response was because it's been a tradition of mine for 17 years. And everybody is saying, okay, well, I didn't, I didn't do my traditions this year right right so it's just screaming of elitism and you know the rules don't apply to me because i'm in power and right and uh it's got the potential to really do our provincial government in we've already had a worker strike a few months ago Uh where hospital workers walked off the job because they are trying to fire eleven thousand of them to hire them back at lower wages under private companies oh nasty yeah during a pandemic, like our oh food workers uh-huh. and our, our cleaners and the people that, you know, we really need in wow. the hospital. So they already had a worker strike. And then this happens a couple months later. And this is the kind of stuff that brings down governments where I am. Wow. So. Wow. So they weren't even just like, way. oh, I'm going to go to Toronto to see my family or something like that. They're off flying around. Wow. Oh, yeah, no, it's I'm going to go to Cancun and enjoy a beach vacation. And around here, um, I definitely live in a place that has been quite fortunate as far as as money and stuff like that. So it's not an abnormal thing for people around here to take a vacation to Mexico or something, usually in January, February, because our winters are so awful in January, (laughs) February. Like we we all have clinical seasonal depression in about february because there's no sun it's minus 40 degrees celsius and it's just you live like you feel like you live in a freezer box essentially Uh so you know there's a lot of people out there saying well i'm not traveling this year and you know and i mean that is the least of their worries for sure not traveling for a year is not gonna you know harm you terribly but it is just that whole two-tier I don't know. Canadians seem a little funny sometimes in that we are quite a fortunate people for the most part, but we know our neighbors are privileged. Like we know people around us have privilege and and have, you know, money and have that kind of stuff. We just don't like it when you show it. (laughs) Like we just don't like it when we get the impression that, you know, you think you're better than me. Like we, we just really, that just doesn't fly with us, especially when, we're working our butts off right now, or there's people out of work or our unemployment right now in this province is the highest it's been in my lifetime. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think it's at 11, 11% right now. So there's businesses shutting down everywhere. And then we've got government ministers going on vacation and it's, it's just not sitting very well with people. Right. (laughs) Right. And so some of them are actually going to lose their jobs. You think a couple have already resigned. Oh, okay. Okay. And there's calls for other ones to resign. Um, actually, Ontario kind of led the way with this and that they had one minister. I'm not sure what his portfolio was, but I, I think it was a pretty important one. Um, he got busted. I think he was in Mexico. And before he even hit the ground back in Canada, he he resigned because it was the right thing to do. And I think his premier just said to him, you know, this isn't going to work out if you don't resign so he's he's completely resigned and then in alberta um three thousand kilometers across the country ours kind of started trickling out a couple days after that and so the precedent had already been set and 
we've had a couple who have said, you know, I'm not resigning and like, we need to win back trust. And this wasn't that, that big of a deal. And, and a couple being really quite defensive about it and making it a lot worse for themselves. Um, there's one town in particular, uh, Slave Lake, I think around there to the north of me, where the city council actually wrote a letter telling the member of the legislature that he hadn't really done his job by the town up to that point, And this was kind of the last straw. And he is being quite defiant about it. And it's just, it's not making him any friends <laughs> whatsoever. And it's making the whole, the whole party that's in power right now, like really bad. So. Wow. It's hard to imagine um, something like that happening in the United States. I know. And I think that that's something that I've really been sitting with this week is, you know, this, this all happened about a week ago, uh, just a little over a week ago, like right after the new year. And it enraged people around here. And it's interesting because the government that we have in this province right now, uh, they've been quite divisive and you know we jokingly half jokingly call our premier right now trump of the north like he's it's very much kind of the same authoritarian hardline conservative um i don't even want to say values but just approach and i find anyways that in canadian politics we're less concerned with the social politics like it, it's almost a little bit foreign for governments to be talking about marriage or abortion or anything like that like that is it's just not really something that is brought into our political arena and when it is brought in it's quite uncomfortable i think for us it's not really something that we we vote on and this government um they started out with some hardline conservative Christian um, ideology in their in their platform, and I wouldn't say that people elected them on that. I find people where I am we're we're very centrist. We're very less is more governments. Like take care of the roads and take care of the parks and take care of the economy right. and stay out of our lives. Essentially, is ten is how people tend to be around here. But um, I think they were voted in over frustration with the economy and with the oil patch here in particular, but it's, it was very, it has very much divided the province that I live in, um, having these people elected. But the interesting thing is that this, this latest scandal with the whole COVID traveling thing has actually united the province. Really? So inadvertently, <laughs> this terrible government has united the province and that everybody's ticked off. <laughs> It's great. <laughs> and it's so interesting because um, <laughs> we're not allowed to meet outside, but everybody's walking around outside these days. And I've seen so many more people enjoying nature and saying hello to, to each other on the street, which is really nice. I mean, I live in a city of, I think we're 1.4 million now. Okay. And it feels like a small town at times. Like I can go to the farmer's market. Well, I used to be able to go to the farmer's market and see 10 people I knew. And, and I think part of that is just, you kind of get your groups and it was a very social city. It was a very um, artistic city mm -hmm. and entrepreneurial city. So you would start seeing the same kind of groups of people around the same places. And yeah, like people are still outside and people are still walking around and, and they're saying hello to each other now, whereas before you would kind of see people on the street and not really, you don't know what they want with you, right? So you wouldn't really look at them or you would just keep walking. But I hear people talking more and people stopping and talking to their neighbors more. And as I go on my walks, as I pass people, I hear people talking about this and I hear people talking about what's going on in the States, of course, too. But just as you kind of eavesdrop as you walk by I hear everybody just saying oh my gosh and can you believe you know this minister or can you believe what he said and yeah it's just it's outrage to us when people think that they're better than us <laughs> so wow. I feel fortunate to live in a place where that is that is just peak insult <laughs> right right well that's that's cool to hear though that it is bringing people together though I mean that's always encouraging to hear people about people coming together yeah. Yeah. And I mean, with with things that are going on now. Um, so our responses to COVID in Canada, they go by province. So each province has had a different response. 
And Alberta, where I live, um, back in December, we were starting to see the highest per capita cases, and it was rapidly getting very bad very quickly, rapidly, rapidly. And I think that that's where the panic set in, is it went from, we were sort of untouched through the summer and through the fall, and then the start of the winter hit, and I think people were just probably spending more time indoors. Mm. And all of a sudden, in late November, early December, we started seeing this exponential ballooning of cases, and we finally had to do something. So our government's response to COVID as well has been very, very highly criticized um, within the province and throughout Canada as well, just as far as not being swift enough and not being drastic enough. At first, they kind of did a sort of lockdown. It was like there's a curfew, and it was sort of a please don't meet other people just please don't you know personal responsibility and all that and restaurants were still open and casinos were still open and gyms were still open and then they did kind of a partial lockdown where businesses could only be open to a certain extent and you can't meet in other people's homes but people of course but restaurants were still open and casinos were still open like Hmm. it just made no sense i couldn't i couldn't walk down the street to see my grandmother but i could meet her in a casino Uh, which made no sense whatsoever. So then, you know, of course, we continue to see cases rising and then our certain ICUs in the city started becoming overflowed. So Mm. they had to do something. But it's almost like they're, I don't know, their bad behavior is bringing us together. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. Right. Then as a a nurse, of course, you're totally seeing uh, how this is affecting the, the health system there. Yeah, for me, it's a little different um, because I work in a specialized neonatal intensive care unit. So the unit that I work on is very specialized cardiac surgery. Um, We get the sickest babies from all over Western Canada and up into the territories as well, so up into the north. So for me, it's more about witnessing the trickle-down effect of it all. Um, I personally had a surgery canceled on December 15th. And so it's that whole trickle down effect of surgeries within my unit being canceled, my own personal surgery being canceled. It's, it's the, yeah, the trickle down of it. And then um, I have friends that work in adult units and in adult ICU, and it's been really harrowing to listen to their stories and see a couple of them get sick. And yeah. So you've seen people get sick there too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've I've had a couple uh, friends from nursing school who have ended up sick and a couple colleagues as well, not in my unit, but colleagues from other places that I've worked get sick. And right. one of them is uh, I think she's going to have long term issues. Oh, so, no. Yeah. Yeah. But I know, you know, people are always asking the question of uh, do you personally know anyone who's been sick or who has died? Yes, I personally know people who have been sick and who have died. (laughs) So, And we did have a scare on my unit as well where we thought that we had an infected patient and it nearly took out 16 people into isolation, but thankfully it was a false positive. But it is just seeing, you know, the effects of it all. Like to have 16 nurses off in isolation for two weeks, like that's that's huge. That's that's a huge drain on resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've been fortunate in that I haven't had a lot of direct exposure to it, but I've had a lot of indirect exposure to it. And then just the protocols in the hospital, since this has all started, the hospital is completely different than it was a year ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some of it, some of it, I don't mind. Some of it I I could definitely do without one day, but, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't necessarily mind the quiet sometimes um just and some of the things that we're doing now are starting to just feel like good practice for general infection control where i don't think that we were relaxed before but um just research is changing now and the way that we are together is changing now and i think a lot more about standing close to my colleagues or i think a lot more about Mm -hmm you know, who's around me or do we need to be this close together or my personal space is suddenly I'm respecting my own personal space a lot more now, which is something I don't think I was doing for a lot of years. Right, right. Well, since you mentioned COVID, one of the things 
that you mentioned when we were talking about what we might want to talk about today was um, pandemic fatigue. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. I, you know, well, I haven't, I haven't written about that. I haven't really talked about that much with people, but I've definitely been feeling things and observing things. So, yeah, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about that. Oh, pandemic fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's something that I've been reflecting on a lot lately too. Is, I mean, this has been almost a year now. Mm -hmm. um, this time last year, I think it was January 18th, so about a week from now, I got really, really sick with something. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it was COVID. I have no idea if it was COVID, but I know I was really sick. And then a couple weeks after that, we started talking about pandemic. And then a couple weeks after that, we were in lockdown. And it's just interesting to think back on the beginning of this. Um, everybody around me anyways was looking for ways to help other people. The healthcare workers, you know, people were coming out of their homes in the night and cheering for us. And we were getting discounts everywhere and, you know, front of the line everywhere. And, and it was all very nice and everything. But um, yeah, a year later, I don't see any of that going on, mm -hmm. which is fine. But I, I definitely have noticed people are tapped. And but I don't think it's I don't know. I don't get the impression that it's registering as acute stress for everybody. Like I've, I've spoken to a lot of people and I'm, I'm also in the space of, I'm just sort of floating along. I'm neither here nor there. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I'm just sort of, I'm not really anywhere. And some days my mind is thinking about what's going on and trying to fathom the future but I find that a little bit fruitless anyways, because the future is always unwritten. You know, we're, right. we're constantly writing it. So I, I can daydream about the future, but I find even those daydreams a little bit intangible these days. Like I, I'm having a hard time planning for things, understandably so. <laughs> but at the same time, um, I, I, I'm, I'm in a three-year herbalism course, you know, so I'm, I'm, doing things with long-term effects, but I'm also not able to comprehend them. Like I'm not able to think about a day when this might be different. And I think that that's a big part of the fatigue is I've been talking to a lot of people who are feeling very fuzzy, just very brain foggy and not really able to um, hold on to thoughts or emotions for very long and, and not really able to be in a space of responding as opposed to reacting to things. And to me, it it feels like um, trauma brain is the only way that I can describe it. Um, I, I suffered with uh, complex PTSD a few years ago, and I've been, I call it in remission, <laughs> in recovery, mm -hmm. um, but it still flares up. And there are some days where I'll be talking to somebody and, and I can almost like somatically feel them like i can i can tell that they're in this space of agitation kind of just a, a low running agitation but also they're not able to really be clear like they're they don't feel clear and and it resonates with me because when i feel myself getting into um a state of you know acute issues i can feel it in my body and I, I can feel, it almost feels like, well, trauma brain number one, it feels like the brain fog and no memory and not being able to think through things. It's like I can't hold on to a thought. And then the the fatigue, the physical fatigue sets in. And that's usually my cue to, okay, I need to go rest for a little bit because <laughs> if I don't, this is going to turn into a week-long thing. But I see people, you know, dealing with... Um, really the trauma of this time and, and the, the not knowingness of this time and the uprooting of this time and also trying to still plug ahead in their lives because they're trying to put food on the table or they're trying to do their job or they're trying to work from home. And, and yeah, I think it's creating a real fatigue in the population where um, I really do wonder about our ability to respond as opposed to react to things that are coming our way. Right. Can you say a little bit about what you see as the difference between responding and reacting? Um, responding is more rooted. 
to me. It's It's got the checks and balances of yourself and maybe other people around you. It's not it's not necessarily an individual thing and it's it's more in service of relationship i think whereas responding to me um or reacting or sorry, reacting to mm-hmm. me <laughs> is very much from a a place of a nervous system in fight flight freeze or fawn and so you're not actually getting the person showing up you're you're getting um, very much a, a somatic response meant to somehow alleviate the stress right now, as opposed, it's more short term as opposed to long term, and I think that the that the effects can be more damaging from reacting as okay. opposed to responding on individual relationships and also on larger, um, more broad relationships too. Right, right. Yeah. So some of what you're talking about in terms of pandemic fatigue. Um, when it comes to the brain fog and not being able to focus on things and also the reacting versus responding. Some of this, I also wonder if it could be or if it's being exacerbated by the fact that people are using social media more now and having more electronic communication from before, but especially the social media part, which we already knew could uh, could take us that way, could take us down yeah. that road, you know? Yeah. Very much so. I've been really wondering about that too. Um, Just because, you know, social media, it extends our reach into the world so much further than where it would naturally be. I mean, naturally, my, my world has gotten very small this year. I shouldn't even say it's gotten very small this year. I've just realized how small my world really is this year, Mm -hmm. as far as the geography that I can actually have some influence over. And also, um, my my physical capabilities to influence my environment. So, you know, my reach in the world, like I've barely been outside of the city in a year. And for me, that's very strange. I, I used to travel quite a bit and I was never really anywhere. I was never really rooted anywhere. I've always had, I, I don't own property where I am. Like I've always been a little in the air and able to uproot. Um, yeah. Me too. I've had a a pattern (laughs) like that as well. Like where this year being in one place for like a whole, I hadn't been in one place for for 12 months in a row in over 10 years or something. Yeah. And then with social media, I mean, here you and I are connected, you know, 3000 kilometers away. Yeah. And I think that there's, there's some goodness to social media in some ways, Right. but at the same time, like it's, you're never face to face with a person, you know, so we're all just talking from our, our deepest impulses a lot of times. And the other thing that I've noticed is, um, and I, I've been, I've been quite resistant to this over the last year. Like when people do this in, in my personal social media space, I'm very much just, no, like that's yours. That's not mine. But you know, people with ideology behind them or some kind of rhetoric that they've been chewing on for a while, they'll come into your social media space and basically look for an opportunity to dump it. And you know that they're just yeah. reinforcing their same thing 10 times a day. And it becomes this this unquestionable truth in their heads, you know, and, and then the other thing about social media too, that I've been thinking about is, um, we're not changing anybody's minds. <laughs> like generally speaking, we're already in our camps right. and, you know, you, you go to somebody's social media page and you're like, I'm going to teach this person about this thing that they said. And it, it just never go. I very rarely see it go that way. So, you know, with the pandemic fatigue and all that as well, I, I, on one hand, I'm, I'm very grateful to have those connections in the world. On the other hand, I miss so many people so dearly because of that, you know, I'm able to see what they're up to and I'm, I'm able to talk with them every day. And, and I do wonder about um, how much time we're spending on there, given that my world has very much become this room that I'm sitting in right now. (laughs) And, you know, most of my outside conversations are, out there via social media yeah but yeah i i also wonder i don't know i've i've tried to pull back a couple times now from social media Mm -hmm. um because i'm social media fatigued and i'm zoom fatigued and i i also think back to the start of the pandemic when people were there was so many offerings 
from people via Zoom and classes and this and that. And it was great because you had no opportunity to be bored if you didn't want to be. I mean, there was constantly something going on. And about a month and a half into it, I couldn't quite put my finger on what was bugging me, but I realized I was Zoom fatigued. I was tired of of talking via video, I guess, which is, I mean, this is fine. I haven't talked via video for a while, but, you know, as far as everybody having a class, everybody having an offering, it just, it became a little much. And and I, I think for me, it increased my longing for people. There's been a lot of things that I've been fortunate to have access to thanks to COVID um, having people move their things online. But at the same time, it's still not the same as, you know, sitting in a class with people or sitting in a group with people and actually talking face to face and being able to register body language. And it's just not the same at all, which I think is setting into some of the fatigue. And I wonder about what the long term effects of this are going to be on how we are with one another when right. we're able to be with one another again, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it does feel like, you know, people have been wanting things to go back to normal, you know, has been the, like a theme. But from the beginning, it's sort of sort of felt to me like, well, this is a door that we're walking through and we're not in the door. It's only one way, you know, like yeah. we won't be going back to a normal after this to the, to the normal we had before. We'll be going into something else, you know. So yeah. and that's that's just going to be revealing itself. And um, it is, you know, I don't care to make many predictions about it because it seems really on there's so many uncertainties mm -hmm. you know that, are, that yeah. are happening you know yeah no i hear you i prefer to wonder about it too and i i can't make any predictions about it but yeah i, I do hear the uh the calls to go back to normal and i i really struggle with this whole idea of normal because i wouldn't say normal before this was working out very well for a lot of people anyways no you know and I, I remember um, it was about this time last year. So the unit that I worked on, it's on the sixth floor of a building and we look west over top of a lot of greenery in the city. I live in a very green city and downtown is behind me, so I can't see it. And this time of year, it's maybe light outside for maybe eight or nine hours. Mm. So when I go to work for 12 hour shifts, I get to see the sunrise and I get to see the sunset. And this time last year, I remember looking out the window and watching a beautiful sunrise and the sky here, um, Alberta is known for its big sky. And so, you know, our, our skies are just huge. I don't know how else to explain it. I didn't fully appreciate it until I went to the coast um, and felt very walled in, like the sky was very low, whereas right. here it's just, it's so big and our, our sunrises and our sunsets can just be epic, you know, just colors and beautiful. And uh, so I was watching the sunrise and I was thinking, I was kind of listening to a couple of my coworkers and one of them was going this place next week and another one was traveling somewhere else next week. And I remember thinking about how everybody was just always headed in their own directions, you know, and, and what the consequences of all of us trying to have our family vacation every year and, you know, having a certain size of house and having like, what are the consequences of everybody tr trying to achieve a certain lifestyle? And um, and then I, I worked all day. And then I remember watching the sun down go, the, the sun go down um, later in the day and looking out and realizing that one of the beautiful bands of color that I was witnessing was brown haze from pollution uh. <laughs> that had accumulated during the day. And I remember thinking to myself, like I've lived in this city for 20 years and 20 years ago, you didn't see that. Like that feels recent right. in the last five years. And the crush of traffic as I'm getting home feels recent in the last five to 10 years. And, you know, watching all the planes take off going 18 million different directions every day. I can, I can kind of see it from where I work. And that feels recent in the last five, 10 years. And I was just thinking about how our normal lifestyle before this was everybody just doing whatever the hell they wanted whenever the hell they wanted as long as they had money to do it and who are you to question it and I looked out the window um I guess it would have been probably about April last year it was during our first big lockdown and I remember watching the sunset 
and I remember seeing maybe three or four cars on the street that I can see and nobody out there. And I remember watching the sunset and realizing there wasn't that band of pollution. And it was just a couple months later and realizing, you know, this is the thing that has slowed us down, that has helped us take stock of what's important in our lives. And I don't know, I can find as many blessings in this time as I can find things I'm not enjoying <laughs> too. Yeah. But yeah, I really yeah. do question this whole language behind let's I can't wait till it goes back to normal. It's not it's not ever going back to normal. It's not ever going back to the way it was. And I don't personally I don't feel like that's a terrible thing. Oh I I don't either. I'm someone who really actively disliked or, or felt kind of oppressed by normal for most of my adult life, you know, I yeah. mean, since I was like 10 or something like that, you know, yeah. so uh, there was, you know, some feeling of relief for me in the spring, when things started to change, I'm like, Oh, look at this, like, it's not, there's not the same overbearing feeling as there, as there once was, you know, right. and uh, more people are now like, um, kind of on the outside looking in or at least one foot in one foot out so there's more people who are, are having a perspective that makes sense to me you know yeah I, I felt a little less alone honestly you know yeah when, when all of that you know started to happen you know and i think that um the we're living in a general time of breakdown anyway if it wasn't going to be if, if the COVID hadn't come along other things you know have been happening too i mean the climate you know it is changing everything, you know, the environment, like, and, you know, there's also just the trajectories that, that, that nations, you know, follow too. I mean, the United States has been in a decline, you know, uh, in some form since the early 70s, but in a really noticeable way since like 2008, since that last um, economic shock that occurred, you know? Yeah. And so um, the one thing I've been noticing is that, is that, is that as these structures start to uh, weaken and start to crumble, that there is there is less of a feeling of being a, sort of pushed down on, you know? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the same power as it once did. And the peer pressure isn't as strong because there's more people who are no longer aligning themselves with those with that system and with those values. There's more people who are feeling left out of it, you know? So there's not as many people being like, well, how come you don't have a real job? How come you aren't blah, blah, blah? How come, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it's funny. Yeah. It's funny when your lifestyle starts to make more sense to the masses suddenly. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm not fringe anymore. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a little bit. It's been a little bit of that. Yeah, it's in use. We're starting to talk about something else we had on our list, which was um, consumption and, con and consumerism. You know, which obviously that's been a big part of the normal, which we just we simply can't afford, you know, no anymore. Yeah, no. Yeah, I, I was already a little on the outside of the normal with that, too. I mean, I I have had a few lifetimes in my life already. Mm -hmm. And so I've I've done the whole being married and having a. I had a half million dollar townhouse at one point oh, wow. with, a, with my ex-husband and um, it wasn't a lifestyle that I was ever really aligned with, but you know, you're trying to, to put two lives together and that was something that was important to him. Whereas I wanted to have one car between us and you know, I, I bikes if we could, but in February that gets a little complicated around here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, since then, um, I'm trying to think, probably six years ago now, I sold most of what I own. And in that time frame, I have pretty much lived, except for one year, I, I did have a place completely to myself. But in those six years, I have pretty much lived in a 100 square foot bedroom. And I share a kitchen and a bathroom with my most excellent roommates who happen to be my family as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's interesting because consumerism and consumption, yeah, I, that's been on my mind for a while because, I mean, anything that I bring into this room, if I bring a shopping bag into this room, I feel crowded. I feel cluttered. I can't, right. it brings up major anxiety. I can't handle it. <laughs> and then I also naturally don't really like to shop, but I do love beautiful things. So for me, um, 
the fast fashion has never been appealing and it's mm-hmm. always been a little bit enraging because to me it's like why wouldn't you want to buy something that you really love that's well made that you know even better if you know the maker but i know that not everybody has has the money for that but there's I mean, there's there's goodwill. I've, I've found great things in vintage stores. I love vintage stores. That's probably my my number one spot. But why wouldn't you want to do that and buy things one time as opposed to buying things 20 times because they fall apart after two wears? Like, I've never really understood that. Yeah. But I've never really been fashionable either. So I don't really get it. But, um, but you know, actually during this time, I can't say that I think consumerism and consumption has gone down a whole bunch where I am. If anything, I think it's gone up because people are sitting at home with nothing to do. And the Amazon gurus, the guys getting all the money up there are doing quite well for themselves. Right. Right. Which has been a little bit unfortunate to see. I feel personally as though um, in activist or environmental circles that we talked about consumption and consumerism more mm-hmm. at one time than we once did too. Yeah. You know, for example, I feel like whereas we once used to have conversations about how uh, damaging cars are to the environment, you know, uh, not just in terms of pollution, but in terms of the infrastructure that supports them, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of the fact that every time you've got a road, that's something else that can't happen. A parking lot, that's a garden that can't happen. You know what I mean? Like all of that, like the, and I'm not sure exactly how bad it is in Canada, but in the US, the suburban sprawl, of course, is a terrible, it's just a terrible place to live, you know, like it's not fun to be there, you know, yeah. like, you know, and I feel like that causes a lot of stress um, in people's lives and a lot of isolation just living in that i mean so there's all these things that are wrong with car culture but in the last few years we've now been talking about electric cars as if that solves the problem yeah that's that's extremely concerning to me the whole green tech thing is very concerning to me because it does it sounds like another fantasy to me if we can have whatever we want yeah without the consequences of it yeah. You know, and the whole, yeah, the electric car thing. And also um, here we seem to be fighting about solar panels uh-huh. because they want to put them in very prime land spaces. And then you combine that with the urban sprawl here. And in the last 20 years of living in this city, I feel like I've watched paradise be paved mm. completely. So the farmland around here, the soil around here and I mean, as a gardener, it's extra heartbreaking because <laughs> I, kn- I know what they're covering. You know, I know what they're covering over. And, and this was, this area was um, black gold as far as soil. And it, it, there's just doesn't seem to be any thought about putting up another estate community or, you know, paving over for another treeless suburb. And yet the urban sprawl here is, it's pretty pronounced as okay. well. Okay, it's um, bad there too. Yeah, it's bad here too. And in the last 20 years of me living here, like the whole south side of the city in particular has really exploded in concrete. Um, And every neighborhood that they put up, it seems to be kind of the same kind of houses and the same box stores. And then you get your same sort of little mini mall areas. And I, there's no trees. And I, I think you're supposed to go there and be in your house and not know your neighbors and, go to your grocery store and you know nothing is very walkable around here either we're just getting our public transit up and going really to the the state that it should be in this city but um i live in a very resource dependent area for sure um due to the cold being one aspect of it but also just due to the expectations of lifestyle yeah. I remember when um, recycling became a big thing when I was a kid, you mm-hmm. know, and this whole thing that we're going to be able to recycle all of our plastic bags. And instead of reducing consumption, it's that whole consequence free myth of, well, you know, I use a plastic bag, who cares? It gets recycled. Right. And we all know that that's not 
what's actually happening. No, it's not happening. <laughs> no, and it just it just increases consumption and it increases the making of things like that as well. So yeah. Yeah, it's interesting this this last year. Um I don't know. As you said, I, I can't really make predictions about how it's gonna be, but I know that my life was already pretty local and I hope I hope other people are finding more pleasure and more community where they are as opposed to constantly projecting themselves into the world and having to go other places looking for what they think they're looking for i know that that's been a big realization of mine this last year and just as far as um consumption and consumerism you know i I had to go to a mall a couple weeks ago to go pick something up. And that was my first time in a mall in probably a year. Oh, wow. And it was, it was horrifying. <laughs> it was a terrible experience. <laughs> and I just remember looking around at all of the stores in this mall. Um, it's quite a fancy mall. And they were all selling pajamas because everybody's staying home. Oh, my gosh. So we're still finding a way to capitalize on this moment. But at the same time, I... I don't know. I don't know if people are going to go running out and hop on the first plane that they can and go on vacation and not, you know, try not to think about it. I don't know if this will motivate other people to organize more locally for the next thing that comes our way. I don't know. I don't know if this will ever end, really. I don't know if there will ever be a definitive end to this or if it will just kind of be a new normal. Yeah. Well, I mean, like like the COVID in particular, you mean? Just the the whole, these kind of threats among us now that are causing us to lock down more and causing us to stay closer to home. I don't right. think COVID is going to be the last virus in my lifetime. I mean, it would be silly no. to think it is. <laughs> no, I'm afraid it probably is not going to be. No, no. And people have been talking for years about how there'll be an increased danger of viruses and epidemics because of the different things that are happening with uh development first of all with like you know going out into the you know breaking that wildland interface more you know because that puts us into contact with new things you know that being an aspect of it but then also you know climate changing and so things being able to live in new areas that they couldn't before you know because you know at some point uh you know well, you know, like mosquito populations, you know what I mean? Like yeah. they'll be able to move further north and they'll bring with them these different things, you know? You know, yeah. at, at one point, you know, at what point do people need to worry about like dengue fever in Florida or something? You know, I mean, yeah. at some point these things will happen. So we all we all knew that, I mean, those of us who are paying attention, we all knew that there was a chance that there was going to be more disease coming and like, oh, here it is, you know? The, the one that, the one that um, really maybe alarms me the most that we haven't seen yet, but which has always been predicted and which has been a pattern of civilization going 10,000 years back is um, famine. Yeah. Because famine has been like uh, just a characteristic of agriculture, you know? Yeah. It's been a boom bust thing forever. And looking back at history, we know there's whole civilizations in the Middle East, you know, the ancient ones that just collapsed, you know, due to that. And, you know, uh, we've gone, um, I mean, really the last time there was a major agricultural crisis in the United States was the thirties was the dust bowl, you know, there hasn't really been anything since then, but you know, we've already seen some of the new extreme weather events that have been happening, the droughts, the floods, et cetera, impacting agriculture, you know? So at some yeah. point there's things that, you know, um, are currently being grown in, in, you know, Nebraska or the Dakotas that, you know, um, will only be able to grow like where you are, you know? Yeah. And then at some point, they'll have to go further north, but like, well, you can't move all the crops. I mean, you run out of space and then at some point you run into day length issues as well. You can't just, you can't just plant anything further north. No. You know, that's not how plants work. Yeah, it's generally <laughs> not how plants work. <laughs> no. I had a little bit of a wake up call with that when I was in Iceland and oh, okay. uh, I was expecting to have a really hard time. I, I went with nothing. Like I, I brought dried food into the country because it is so expensive there. And this was a bare bones trip. I, I camped on my own for 12 days because I didn't want to pay for 
a hotel. So I brought food into the country and drove around and camped on my own for 12 days. And I was really anticipating having a hard time finding fresh produce. Um, But they have geothermal greenhouses there. And I was buying fresh peppers, like fresh bell peppers for less than I can buy them here in Canada. Oh, wow. But yeah, I've been wondering about that too. Um, And also wondering about, you know, our responses to that and what unnatural things we will think of to mitigate that. Um, And then I've also been thinking about food waste a lot as well. Big issue. I know Canadians were some of the worst in the world for food waste per capita. And, you know, the more that these days go on i i'm really bothered by um the disparity between some people having way way more than they need and other people having much less than they need and also not having access to the social supports that they may have had right. prior to covid as far as food and stuff goes yeah that's been something that's been really on my mind but yeah i've been wondering about Uh, food production and carrying capacity of the land and what happens when we exceed the carrying capacity of the land. And as somebody who works in birth work and who works in um, neonatal intensive care as well, our fertility issues have changed over the last course of my lifetime. For sure, we're seeing a lot more infertility and we're seeing things in the NICU. We're seeing some things that don't necessarily have a name, Um, very rare things. And so I I do. I wonder about the carrying capacity of the lands and human population. And I wonder about, you know, our ways of mitigating these things, um, supposedly with the hope of alleviating suffering on humanity but it seems to be with alleviating the suffering on some of humanity not all of it right right now you mentioned population and i've been thinking about that one recently too i listened to a podcast um to josh schlossberg has a podcast called green root and it's all environmental stuff you might enjoy it it's it's pretty interesting and and he has really good guests on and he had a guest on to talk about the the um the topic of of overpopulation because that's a really controversial topic, right? It so is, you have yeah. you have people who say, um, you know, that overpopulation that there 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 are too many humans or there shortly will be too many humans, and then you have people who say, oh, if you even bring that subject up like that, you're line, aligning yourself with eugenicists, right? Right. And with racist people in the north because all talk about overpopulation is really just talk about about overpopulation in the global south and there is no population problem the carrying capacity of the earth can still be much greater than it is and our only problem is consumption is that we're consuming too much right so that's the that that i i hear this this argument made a lot and i have trouble buying it personally i think in part because i've spent so much time uh, traveling and camping and being out in in wild places, not on public land, and just seeing the effects that uh, this culture is having just right here. So I'm not thinking about you know uh, I'm not thinking about you know the brown people. You know what I mean? As, as they yeah. say, you know what I mean? Like no, I'm I'm actually just looking at the United States. I'm looking at you know the mix of people we have here, and I'm like really concerned about uh, what we're doing. For the for the sake of living, you know, here, you know, like so many places are just getting chewed up, you know, yeah, and and spit out, you know, yeah. uh, for, for for agriculture is is a really big one, you know. I mean, people talk about sprawl, and sprawl is a problem, but in terms of just like uh, sheer area, agriculture has a much larger footprint than urban areas do you know oh, yeah. i mean it's huge you know what i mean like you know yeah. you look at some place like california and like you know the you know terrible sprawl of like la or whatever you know wow look at that it's taking up so much room yeah and, and, and lots of it's ugly yeah well then you can drive and you can spend the entire day driving through the central valley of california mm-hmm. much larger land mass you know large, large, larger area you know that all used to be wetlands that all used to be wildlife habitat you know and now yeah. it's all agriculture. A lot of it's chemical agriculture. A lot of it's monocrop. I mean, 
And so one thing that got mentioned on this podcast was um, uh, a formula that some people use where they're talking about impact. And they say impact equals population times technology times affluence. Mm -hmm. So they're saying that the impact that humans have is, is, is relying on those three things, how many people there are, population, and then technology, what level of technology we're using, because uh, there's more impact, the more complex the technology is, and then affluence. So that one's pointing right at consumption there. And it's saying, yeah, how wealthy you are, because how wealthy the culture is, the, the more of an impact you're having too. And I'm like, well, so I don't have to pick, right, of either consumption or population, because they're both factors, right? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of how, to me, that makes sense to look at it that way. Yeah. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about, um, <laughs> I'm having five thoughts converge at once right now, because the whole way of looking at that is that it, as though it needs to be one or the other, right, is a very Western way of looking at things, you know, this whole idea that we have to, we have to have two thoughts, and they're automatically competing, and yeah. one of them has to win. <laughs> Personally, I've been trying to get away from that, because that's just not how relationships work. You know, and and that's just not how anything in the world works. I mean, I I can't think of many things where there is one definitive truth that can never be questioned and can never be disproven and is always, always, always 100 percent certain. Like I just this whole idea of it has to be one or the other. It's like, no, let's have more nuanced conversations where there doesn't have to be a winner and there doesn't have to be a loser. Do you know what I mean? Right. To me, it, it's like humans obviously are having a huge impact on the earth i mean you talk about even going out into the wild i have a hard time finding wild places right now that don't have a piece of garbage in them somewhere like there, what even is a wild place anymore besides oftentimes you know when i think of the wild places that i visit around here they're open air zoos i mean there there's a place that i was just at a few days ago um a place called Elk Island National Park. And it's a very, very small area in relation to the rest of this province. And it's where I think the last bison in this province are caged, oh, <laughs> essentially. Wow. Like there's a, there's a fence, there's fences around it. And there's two population of bison on either side of the highway and they don't ever get to meet each other either. There's woods mm. bison on one side and plains bison on the other side. And so, you know, I, I go to this national park, this preserved place, this wild place, and there's cars everywhere and there's people everywhere and there's garbage everywhere. And it, I just, to me, it's not an either or argument, you know, it, it's, it's like, of course, 7 billion people, most of who are living in cities, are going to have an impact on the earth. And the impact of cities is that they draw from everything else around them to get into the cities. And then, of course, with affluence, you know, your more affluent people. <laughs> now I'm thinking about the fall of Rome and how they had a very affluent class of people who, when Rome fell, they couldn't feed themselves because they were used to being fed by everybody else, right. you know? So you you get a high end of affluent people who are doing super specialized work. I mean, the more affluent the population as well, the more specialized the population is going to be. And I see that in medicine right now. You know, they talk about shuffling me to an adult ward for COVID. And I, I don't work without, like, I don't work with adults. A nurse is not even a nurse anymore. It's like, no, I'm a super specialized nurse. I can't just go work. I could be a some service with adults, I'm sure, but it's not the same. It's not what I'm trained for. And so as you get these specialized lifestyles, these urban lifestyles, these, um, I call them the, the nouveau rich. And I mean, I, I'm an example of the nouveau rich. I'm the first person in my family um, outside of my parents' generation to have a middle-class lifestyle, to have a middle-class income. You know, my my parents are the first people in my family line to do that. I'm the first one in my family to go to university. And so in some ways, like these these advances, in some ways, I mean, a lot of the Canadian population has secondary education, post-secondary education. Um, some of these things are great, but at the same time, they're not without cost and consequence. And I think that that's, that's the thing that we're battling with with technology 
is the more complex the technologies that we attempt to create and use to get away from our cost and consequence. Like we're just creating more cost and consequence somewhere down the line, but we're constantly shoving it over there. And especially with urban populations, it's all over there. It's all out of sight. It's all away. But even throwing something away, it still goes somewhere. There's no such thing as away, you know? Yeah, no, there's no such thing as away. We're all here on the same planet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then when you, when I think about within my own lifetime and this place that I am now, like the West of Canada is fairly new as far as development and settlement. Um, my family is originally from the East. They're from close to Detroit, actually. Uh, Windsor, Detroit area is where my people originally settled. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think about my own family stories and my own family history, not just oral stories, but also well-documented um, things about how members of my family were living into the late 1800s and they were living among the indigenous population. There was a relationship there. And then uh, through various issues having to do with um, the outcome of the war of 1812 and the borders and the rebellions and, and industrialization, that whole area that my family is from became very quickly industrialized. And it went from what sounds like heaven on earth, where there was an abundance of food and farms and people growing their food and, you know, taking care of the land and, and living in relationship to a place trying to anyways, um, it very quickly became concrete. And so I look at where I am now, I'm the first generation here in Alberta. And I remember when I was a kid, the main highway in Alberta was a two lane highway still, and you had to watch out for deer and you had to watch out for animals on the highway. It was a big concern when you were driving down the road to the next city. And I realized about 10 years ago, the highway's twin now, and we had an oil boom here with the tar sands, mm -hmm. oil sands. And I remember watching the influx of people to this province when I was a teenager and being angry about it, um, being very angry about, you know, people coming from wherever and they're just coming for the money. They're just coming to, to work. They don't care about this place. And then they go back home and they, they trash it. You know, but also realizing as I get older, like I'm, I'm a benefactor of that trashing as well. So what right. what is my responsibility now? And that's been a big question of my my adult life is what is my responsibility now to give back? Because my life has been funded by resources that I don't agree with. Necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like there's probably a lot of people who can think of instances they've seen where they've seen personally the impact of population in a, a local place, you know, yeah. in a place that they've known. I think that a lot of people have seen that and yeah. would admit that, well, yes, of course, when the number of people in this area increased, it, it had an effect, you know, and then, uh, of course, being that we're in the global north, we have to think about the fact that the technology and affluent parts of that equation are predominantly us, you know, and the people who are saying it's consumption, not not population are correct when they point out that the, the consumption levels we have, you know, in the industrialized countries are way different, you know, like we are, we're using up a lot more you know, yeah. in, in these in these countries. And so so, yeah, we do need to talk about consumption, but we're not talking about yeah. consumption, you know, and, and I just to jump back to food waste really quick. I think in the United States, the rate of food waste is something like 40 percent, you know, I mean, it's a tremendous amount of waste, you know, yeah. and like there's really there's very little effort to do anything, you know, about that. You know, mm -hmm. and to think about all of the resources that are used to create that food, which is then just wasted, you know, yeah. is just heartbreaking, you know, uh, yeah. especially for me when I think of the animals who were raised, uh, you know, in confinement and then slaughtered and then we didn't even eat them. I mean, we didn't even, you know, nothing. So yeah. then that was for nothing, you know, like, yeah. like, you know, and then of course, one thing that we rarely think about is that any place that was agriculture was 
wildlife habitat previous to that. So, right. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so if, if, you know, no matter what your diet is, you're having an impact on the natural world and you're having yeah. an impact on, on, on animal life, you know, and on native plant life and all of that. So, and these mm -hmm. are not, these are not things that we're thinking about, you know, it, it's like, it's like the discussion of consumption is just off the is is just off the table. Well, and to me, to me, it's it's missing a conversation about individualism, and it's missing a conversation about relationship to places that we call home, and you know, it's missing a conversation about um, what is enough. And you know, I think that there's enough for everybody but for whatever reason if you look down the arc of history we keep on repeating these patterns of an elite class being fed kind of there's a, a middle group for a little while and then usually the income disparity gets ridiculous and it becomes unlivable for the majority of people you know and then you have some kind of falling of some sort right. be it of empire or of monarchy or of something but I, I really do wonder about, um, yeah, just the ongoing march of individualism and how we, how we're socialized, really, and how we, we start looking at that socialization um, differently. And, you know, if we can change our own minds, I don't know, because our minds are kind of the base programming. I don't know if you can change your base programming <laughs> that you're working with. I mean, I, I think you can you can mess with the operating system a bit, but I don't know if you can change the hardware. And so I don't know when it comes to consumption and all that. Like I, I think about <laughs> this is going to sound like a very strange memory, but um, I was six years old when I had my first existential crisis. <laughs> And I was sitting in traffic um, the first 10 years of my life. I was in Calgary, not in Edmonton, where I am now. And big city, big cosmopolitan city by Alberta standards. And we were sitting in traffic. My mom had picked me up. And um, yeah, we were driving up this hill from downtown. And I remember, you know, back in the 80s, like you could still smell diesel you could still smell exhaust and because the cars were crappier back then I don't know and I remember sitting in traffic and being stuck and there were so many cars around and had the window rolled down a little bit and I couldn't stand it so I rolled the window back up but then I was too hot so I rolled it down a little bit and I remember smelling the exhaust and I said to my mom does everybody in the world drive a car and she said well no not everybody not everybody can have a car and I said, well, why not? And she said, well, some people can't afford it. In other places, they don't need them. And, you know, it, it's just different everywhere. And I said, okay, well, how many people are in the world? And I don't remember what she said, but, you know, at the time, it was probably like billions. <laughs> why is this six-year-old asking me so many questions? And I said to her, well, in all of the billions of people in the world, how many do you think drive a car? And she said, oh, God, I don't know. You know, why are you asking me so many questions? And then I said to her, well, does everybody in China drive a car? And she said, no, I don't think so. I think they have really good public transit. <laughs> and I just remember having this, this moment of, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen one of those movie shots where it's like you're one person and then it just pans out, pans out, pans out, and you're in a sea of cars. And I remember having a moment of sitting there going, oh, my God, like it was my first existential crisis at six years old. And I said to my mom, well, how would it be if everybody in the world lived like us like if everybody in the world drove a car and they had their own house and they had just a couple people in a house and they ate whatever they wanted every single meal like how would that be and having that realization that yeah if everybody lived a lifestyle like we do in the north for the most part you know I'm not everybody obviously I mean there's huge income disparities where we are too but if everybody lived this lifestyle how quickly would things, would resources be eaten up? And, you know, looking at where I am now, like my province in my lifetime, the, the population has doubled in my lifetime. And that, that feels very fast all of a sudden. And it's very difficult to think about what that's going to look like in 60 years, what's going to be left in 100 years, you know, and, and, 
we don't think about that anymore, which is really stunning to me. We're, we're very willing to have children and very willing to have babies, it seems. I mean, I'm, I have no shortage of work. But as far as thinking about, you know, what the world looks like for those, those ones coming up behind us, I don't, I don't know if we really think about that anymore. But I do think these COVID days have given a lot of people pause to think about it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that really strikes me about COVID too, um, I was thinking the other day about the Second World War in particular and about how the people who are overwhelmingly dying from COVID are the people with memory of that. So, you know, we've already shut away a lot of our seniors and seniors' homes, but what happens to a population of people living in an age of amnesia because they don't have that memory passed down from their elders and their olders. You know, what happens to a population of people that doesn't have elders anymore? I really wonder yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it doesn't bode well, that's for sure. No, you know, and I, I wonder what it means for people to, um, to not have any stories about you know, I remember differently for people who can't remember differently or how things might have been or how things could have been. And then I also wonder about just the overwhelm of these days feeling like, you know, you're just one person in a sea of millions of people just doing their own thing. And I guess that's where the, the questions about individualism and relationship to places that we call home comes into play with me, which is actually something I've been thinking about a lot lately, given what's going on in your country. <laughs> right, right. Relationship to places that we call home. Right, right. Well, the the how the society has broken everyone down into individuals making their own choices, you know, and that there's not really a collective entity, there's not a communal entity, and that there's apparently no systemic issues because it's all just about the choices that we're making as individuals. Like that's all been really problematic you know, too, yeah. because in terms of consumption, well, you know, it is, a, it, it's a, there are systemic problems that are causing that consumption, you know, I mean, not everyone can pick up and move to a city where they don't have to drive anymore, because there's good public transportation, you know, yeah. and when too many people pick up and do move to a city where it's bikeable, or has pretty good public transportation, like Portland, Oregon, it becomes unaffordable, you know, <laughs> And so, <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's yeah. been a really big problem, you know, there. But then it's also true that, you know, it works out really well for the, the corporations who are profiting off of all of this consumption and all this resource extraction if we all just are blaming ourselves all the time and think, oh, mm -hmm. if only I lived a better life, you know? If only yeah. I was making, you know, better choices, you know? And because right. it's not it's not just us there's there's these larger forces that are that are driving everything and those those forces really need to be addressed those are the ones that need to be brought under control you know mm -hmm. somehow and i think that there's a sense of helplessness that people have who are aware of these big forces you know but i think there's also a sense of helplessness among those who aren't so much because i think that the society just does this to people. Yeah. I think people have a deep need for belonging. I really have found that. And in, I've said it on your show before, in a society of strangers, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're found um, with this, this longing for belonging, but without an outlet for it. And so we, you know, we, we prescribe to identities. We assert ourselves in that way instead of um, listen I guess. And I, I don't know. I, I think corporations profit on that as well. You know, us buying our identities and us buying a certain lifestyle and us trying to present ourselves a certain way because it is all about um, kind of the surface level of the individual because no one really knows you. I mean, if you're not ever part of a well community and I use the word community really carefully here because um, I hear that word tossed around a lot, but I've really been thinking about what community means 
this year in particular, it can't just be people who like to do things together. You know, how do you handle conflict? How do you handle, um, yeah, things that, that might be difficult? And, you know, do we get into consumption of humans in that way too, where we're so willing to throw people away when they don't jive with the community anymore. And then you get ever so specialized groups, you get smaller and smaller groups of echo chambers. I really wonder about that as well, but yeah, I, I see a a deep need for belonging among humans. And that's a little bit funny for me to say, because I, uh, I definitely have the hermit gene and I am definitely an introvert and I can, I can go, I have gone, you know, people talk about Vipassana retreats. Mm -hmm. I, I used to take airplanes to go places I could be by myself and not talk to anybody. Like I went to Iceland for 12 days to camp on my own. I talked to one soul in 12 days and I was perfectly fine. But I have to remember that, um, I'm able and comfortable to do those kind of things because I have an awesome support network behind me with family and friends. And I know that they're still just over there, but when I think about, you know, globalization and, and the, the idea that we should do whatever we want, if I want to move somewhere, why shouldn't I move somewhere? You know, if, if something is shiny over there, why shouldn't I go follow it? But then you get people who who talk about loneliness and a lack of sense of belonging. And yeah, I do wonder about um, how much we purchase and consume with a wish of belonging to something, you know, it's, it's like filling a soul hole that's never actually filled because we're not working on the underlying roots of what our longing is. Yeah. Well, if you look at advertising, so much of it is, is, addressing exactly what you're talking about, you know, yeah. and, and, and to some degree, it's, it's both creating that sense of isolation and then saying, Oh, here's how you can fix it. Here's how you can belong, you know, yeah. and the advertising industry, I've been thinking a lot about advertising and media lately, because I think that we underestimate how powerful it is in our lives. You know, I think that mm-hmm. everyone should spend an afternoon uh, learning about Edward Bernays and what he did to our culture, you know, and do, do you know that name at all? Or, I don't okay. actually know. Well, he was, well, just briefly, he was Sigmund Freud's um, nephew, and he basically invented public relations in the early mm. 20th century. And he, a lot of the things that advertising does and how it works, he started those. And he based a lot of them on the things that his uncle had discovered, you know? And so, oh, here's how human brains work. And here's what what drives people, here's what motivates people. Oh, okay, well, let's use that. Let's like make messages that then are addressing that in order to sell them things, you know? And so he was a big part of, uh, of, of, he, back then they used the word propaganda at first. It wasn't a bad thing. You know, I think he, yeah. he, he brought in the word public relations at some point in order to sort of separate it from that word, you know, but there's a famous story of how, uh, he was hired by a cigarette company to help increase the number of women who were smoking because it was mostly men who were smoking cigarettes, not women, right? And so this was the 1920s. And what he did was uh, he associated, uh, did an advertising campaign where he associated smoking with the suffragettes and smoking oh and smoking with, uh, with, with independent women, you know? And, and he did a stunt where there was a parade that was happening in New York, a famous annual parade, and he hired... A bunch of women to dress out very fla- fa- fashionably, like flappers, you know, and to mm-hmm. go out there and to smoke, you know, publicly because it wasn't really that acceptable at that time for women to smoke in public. But he chose these fashionable women to go out there to do that, and they were also talking about women's rights, you know, and all this and that. And and it, the the number of women who smoked increased like just in an, uh, tremendously just within a couple of years, you know, because this, this got picked up on, there were photographs, it was kind of a sexy story, you know, I don't it's know. It's all if very into... seductive. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> yeah. So, so Edward Bernays was part of inventing this whole 
like industry of convincing us what we need, you know, and and using these really subtle ways based on our psychology. So knowing, oh, here's a button to push. Let's push it. You know what I mean? And that, you know, led us directly to where we are now. And I think that I don't know if Canadians have the same trait, but it seems like a lot of U.S. Americans have this trait where they're like, oh, um, I can see through advertising. It doesn't work on me. You know what I mean? Or <laughs> I can I can see through propaganda. It doesn't work on me. You know what I mean? I can watch, yeah. you know, cable news or whatever, and that's not going to affect me. I'm just I, I can watch it to see what they're doing, what they're saying, but I'll be OK. And it's like, well, no, it's really sophisticated, you know, like you 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 can't expose yourself to these things, you know, without some risk, you know, and well, you really need to be on top of it, very alert to being like, oh, how did that set of images just make me feel? What did those trigger? How do you know? Yeah. And most people are not going to be that that aware of it and they're going to get pulled in. And that's not saying a bad thing about people at all. This stuff is designed to, 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 yeah. to pull us in and then to sell us these these things. And right. We just everyone thinks they're so independent and so smart and, and, and we don't realize how much we of our ideas about ourselves are being, you know, essentially implanted, you know, by yeah. advertising and by by the media. And social media has gotten really good at this. And we know they've hired people from the, the from psychiatry and psychology to help them figure out how to make it addictive. I mean, those stories have come yeah. out. That's just true, you know? The same way that yeah. anthropologists have been used, you know, to help um to, to to help colonial people, you know what I mean, like conquer. You know what I mean? Like like there there's a sad history here of science and scientists being, you know, being pulled into this. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so uh I think that it's really important to go on media fasts sometimes, you know, for this reason, you know, it, just to give, give oneself some perspective. So then when you go back, you can feel it a little bit more, at least at, at least at first, you know? Yeah. It's tough though, because there's the other layer of that too, of when your friends become the walking advertisements, mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're trying to keep up with, with whatever you're trying to keep up with as well. And uh, Canadians, I don't know that we... I don't, I don't know. We're a funny bunch. Our whole identity is based on not being you guys. <laughs> but, but truthfully speaking, like America doesn't stop at the border by any means. Like we're, we're very, um, we have our sights on affluence as well, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think where I am anyways, it's just become so normal for people to travel and to, you know, have have the newest thing or have a new car or that kind of thing a lot of people don't really think about it but um but yeah i i don't know i i haven't had cable or television since i was 23 um when the 24-hour news channels started being a thing i was living by myself and i was at the end of my first degree my first degree is in psychology and sociology so and that was during um, that was during the end of the Bush years, mm -hmm. and we didn't really have twenty four seven news up here. I think it came like shortly after you guys started having it, but I really remember it for some reason when I was about twenty three, and so to age myself, that would have been fifteen years ago. And um, I was living by myself, and I had CNN on all the time in the background, oh. mm -hmm. all the time. Because I, I lived alone and I just needed some background noise and I would go to school, but I didn't really have much of a life outside of that. Like I had a job and my boyfriend at the time lived in a different town. So I would go home on the weekends and, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of friends here in the first few years that I lived here. So it was a lot of studying on my own and listening to CNN. And um, I think after about six months, I became convinced that there was going to be a nuclear war with Iran like tomorrow because all you heard on CNN was this ramp up of you know at that time it was talking about the axis of evil and as soon as I heard that I'm like there's the hit list oh my gosh this is 
you know, what is the world going to be like? Like you just start seeing dystopian everything everywhere. And I, I had a little bit of a breakdown actually, Mm, because mm -hmm. I started having to ask myself, like, is this all there is, you know? So what, like I have to be a pawn in somebody else's religious war like this. I didn't sign up for this. I don't want anything to do with this. And then, you know, having to really contend with, um, how much control do you really have as a single organism on this earth? And I've learned time and time again that I am just one factor in my best laid plans. You know, good good for me for trying to assert my will into things, but perhaps it's it's a little better to learn to flow like water than brace yourself like a bison. That's <laughs> right. what I've learned in life. <laughs> but um, yeah, I got rid of cable TV and all of that way back then because I realized like it is messing with my head and some good things came out of that. I actually went into nursing because of that breakdown um, because at the very depths of, of wondering about, is this all that there is, you know, is this all that there is to human life is war and greed and, and stuff like just consuming stuff. I don't, you know, I was having a really hard time with it and that, At the root of that, the thing that made sense to me at the time was to ask, how can I be of service? And when I start, when I started um, focusing on myself a lot less, I found a lot more joy (laughs) in life. And when I asked how I could be of service, nursing was the answer, which was totally not on my radar at all. Nursing to start was the answer, which was not on my radar at all. Interesting. But I found that during COVID as well. when it first happened here, I couldn't watch the media. I, I couldn't watch the news because it was all so very alarmist. And you hear the same story, you know, three times in a day. A lot of it is pre-recorded stuff that they just play over and over again. If you watch it long enough, you'll see the same story over and over again. And so thinking about what that probably does to somebody's mind and watching now the effects of what media has done to people's minds in your country <laughs> acutely right now. Um, you know, I remember the first time I, I was exposed to Fox News and being horrified right. by it because I was yeah. I was studying sociology at the time and it was so blatantly propaganda, like skewed, biased propaganda. You know, I, I remember thinking this this can't be serious people aren't taking this seriously no people are taking it seriously that's been usually the root shock of my life is what i think people the rational thing to not do seems to be what people do but but yeah um i think we're also fooling ourselves i find a lot of people i'm surrounded by anyways we're we're fooling ourselves a bit by saying you know i don't watch tv i'm not exposed to media i don't i don't partake in any of that i'm on facebook like that's that's replaced TV for sure. That has completely replaced um, twenty four seven news. It's its own yeah. form of twenty four seven news. Yeah, and you know I'll be showing my age here a little bit when I say that uh, I remember in the nineties, late nineties, when I was in my my uh, late twenties. At that time, when the internet was still pretty new, and there was still wasn't anything streaming. I mean, nothing like that. You know, it was just there were maybe message boards or whatever. You know. But at that time, it was popular among, you know, intellectuals, you know, or people who consider themselves in intellectual or like artistic circles to not watch television, you know, and to not have a television, you know, or to be like, well, we only have a TV because every once in a while we watch a movie or something like that, you know, and it was like this point of pride, uh, you know, to to be to not be uh, not be participating in that, you know, and. I I know that um, television television was viewing was basically at its peak at around that time as well. You know, mm-hmm. then as the internet came in, I noticed that sentiment start to go away, and I noticed mm-hmm. that the internet started to provide all the things that TV was doing before. You know, especially once we got all the streaming services, uh, mm-hmm. it's like, well, but that is television. You know, yeah. there it is again. Now it's just coming out of your laptop or out of your phone instead of the box, you know, but it's not, it's not different. And then what happened to that 
to that strain among, you know, certain intellectuals or artistic class or whatever to take pride in not being connected to that. I don't see that really anymore. Like the number of people who take pride in not using the internet, you know, or right. not being on social media, like it's, it's much smaller. It's not really there. And so I'm like, wow, like th there's many ways in which I feel as though the, the, um, you know, Western culture has really been in, in a, in, in a decline over the last 20 years of particular kinds, that being, that being one of them, you know, yeah. like there, there's been more, well, I, I would say that thoughtfulness has been disappearing, you know, mm -hmm. and then some of these older traditions, you know, uh, have been, have been disappearing, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that some of it is because the technology has become so sophisticated and is able to pull us in and on mm -hmm. and one hand. And I also think that, uh, 9 11 and the war on terror also had a big effect in the in the political arena that's that's not that's not acknowledged enough you know yeah yeah, yeah what you're talking about too with streaming services as well um, to me it's another play to extreme individualism again because we can view what we want to view specifically on our own personal devices whenever we want to do it and so really you know, our, our wants are being catered to as long as we have the money for a streaming service and, and internet. I mean, um, yeah, I, I really do have to, I don't know, I'm kind of looking around my 100 square feet right now going, right, I am by myself in a small room most of the time, and I can watch what I want when I want, and I can, you know, talk to who I want when I want. And, and really, it's all on my terms, and that's somehow become a very righteous thing. Right. You right. know, I I mean, I've been guilty of it myself, telling people, like, I, I don't have the space to contend with whatever right now, or I, or I, I, need a, I need a break from responsibilities or something right now, or I need a break from relationships right now, which I don't think is a terrible thing. <laughs> Sorry, Sasha's digging a hole in my bed. <laughs> Mm -hmm. small dog um but at the same time I, I really do have to wonder about um again the long-term consequences of our individuality and and becoming more insular in a way in that i don't have to engage with the world if i don't want to you know outside of a screen like it, it's becoming very easy and i really do wonder about the long-term con consequences of covid and lockdown as far as people engaging in a genuine way with other people i think some people are starving for it but other people you can get your groceries at home now you can get you don't have to go out to buy clothes you don't really have to um engage face to face with any other human beings if you don't want to and i suspect that there are, are some people who are going to adopt some of the features of this current lifestyle change we find ourselves in and adopt it for the long term I mean, as long term as it as it can be, because at the same time, I think that a lot of the infrastructure that allows all this to happen, especially the digital infrastructure, is um, it takes a lot more energy and a lot more resources than we than we think about it usually, you know, you know, and also uh, it's 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 delicate to a certain degree, too, you know, yeah. I mean, the, it, it's the kind of technology we have now is much more delicate and vulnerable than it used to be. I mean, think of like, uh, you know, a train and railroad tracks, not so yeah. vulnerable, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, then then think about like, you know, uh, all the think about think, I mean, the phone itself, of course, is very, you know, the handheld devices, you know, all the technology itself is very vulnerable, you know what I mean? Like, you can drop it and have it not work anymore, all of a sudden, you know, etc. But then there's just the all of the the grid and all that sort of thing, which in the United States, I know, especially is very is, is aging, you know, it's not able to keep up with all this. And so there comes a point eventually where we're not actually going to be able to live like this, you know, and so right. then what happens then when we're out of practice for what it's like to just be living in the real world, cooperating face to face and having to take to, to observe what's happening around us and yeah make decisions based on on that, you know, and of course, you know, all I'm talking about there is is the default of human existence for at least 200,000 years before we started this civilization thing where we were, you know, 
living outside, you know, and <laughs> in, in small, food. yeah, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. In, you know, in small groups, you know what I mean? And some of us were yeah. more migratory than others. Some were more sedentary, but we were all actually dealing directly with, with life, you know, and with nature, you know, on a daily basis, everyone knew where their food came from because they 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 dug it up or 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 you know shot, shot it the themselves or yeah exactly you know fish shot it yeah they they you know and so there wasn't a, there wasn't a mystery about any of these things and you also we also knew then what kind of decisions we could make you know mm -hmm. I mean there were you know complex systems of resource management you know that existed that were completely oral you know. Yeah. And and they were conveyed through stories, they were conveyed through songs, you know, and it wasn't written down. And it all worked really well, you know, for a while. I remember reading about how there were indigenous populations in North America that uh, that, that would um, uh, track beaver populations, you know, and there were people who, who like, basically, they knew this particular creek or part of this creek and this part, you know, these people knew this. And so they from direct observation all the time, they were like, okay, this is a year where we can take this many beavers. This is a year where we have to be really careful and like basically leave most of the beavers alone, you know? And yeah. some, some Western scientists came in and was like, oh, you know, I'll bet this would be a lot easier if they were using spreadsheets, you know what I mean? And so, <laughs> I know, I know, we laugh, everything. right? I know, we laugh, but like, they, they really thought this was a good idea, right? So they introduced this, you know, spreadsheets and that kind of technology to these people and it didn't actually work as well. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, I really, do. <laughs> I know I, you just hit on like, Oh my God, my head's exploding right now. Cause you just hit on like <laughs> five different things. That I've well, I mean, I'm kind of a primitivist at heart, so I'm, I'm always going to bring it back to that, but yeah. <laughs> oh, I hear you. I am, I am too. And I mean, it's been, okay. So first off, it's, it's really interesting to me um, about how tenuous this advanced technology we have really is but then also how people who can remember a time before something like the internet like my my small little pocket of a generation i'm not gen y or gen x but i'm also not a millennial and that in between where i i do have those years in my life i remember when the internet was turned on like I, i'm old enough to remember when there was no internet but the ones coming up behind me don't have that and I think that became most apparent to me when um, I taught nursing for three years at a university here and my last group of students were at a high school um, they were about 17 to 19 years old and I had them in the winter semester and I back then like we we only got computer charting where I am last year and oh, so wow. we were paper yeah like we're we're a little bit I, I don't know. I didn't feel like we were behind. It was working fine for me. But um, but yeah, so I was showing them a chart, like a, a paper written chart. And one of my students said, well, we can't read that. And I said, oh, well, you'll you'll learn how to read medical nomenclature next year. Don't worry about it. And she's like, no, 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 like, we can't read that. And I said, well, I know doctors have some pretty bad handwriting, but you learn, you learn to read it. And she goes, no, we can't read that kind of writing. And apparently I got scary because my head nearly exploded because I realized I'm like, they didn't teach you cursive writing. And she right. said, no, they don't teach us that in school anymore. Right. And so I started going on about, well, what are you going to do when the computer system goes down? What are you, what are you going to do when the servers <laughs> fail? How right. are you going to like, do you print your name? I don't understand. <laughs> and, uh -huh. And, you know, and then two seconds later, I'm like, okay, well, we're going to get the handouts that I did in grade three and we're teaching you guys cursive. And they're all sitting there going, this wasn't part of my clinical. And I'm sitting there going, I don't care. Like, this is a life skill. You need to learn <laughs> this because again, what, how are you going to communicate if you don't know how to write? But then I've also been thinking about, like you were talking about with spreadsheets and beaver pelts and all that. <laughs> I've been thinking about um, the consequences of, of literature and of counting everything and what that does to our relationships with other people and dominance and supremacy and what that does to our relationships with the places that we call home. Because again, like you introduce literature and suddenly that becomes the truth. And, you know, and 
within my own um, ancestral community, this has been a little bit of an issue in that I, my dad's side of the family anyways comes from a, a culture that was mixed, not necessarily mixed with a bunch of DNA. I'm very French in my DNA, um, but was mixed with indigenous populations and a unique culture did evolve out of that. And that's, that's, there's remnants of it now still, but it's also fairly gone. But one thing that the French Canadians were really good at doing was keeping records. And so as far as searching for French Canadian genealogy, um, it's not difficult, but you write down those records and that is suddenly the whole story. Whereas within mm. the community that I'm in, there's oral stories and other accounts. And then you get people who are so focused on the, but this record says this about this person and that's the whole story. And it's like, no, <laughs> there's other interpretations. There's other ways of being really in relationship in the community that I come from. And it's, it's been really stunning to watch just the consequences of literature, even within that small group of people about um, what is true and not true and accuracy and, and our focus these days on, I guess, yeah, that whole Western thinking of the single truth as opposed to um, being in relationship with each other and being in relationship with, you know, the past and the present and, and, yeah, listening to other voices. And I think about that too, when it comes to, you know, counting resources and counting things like beaver pelts, like what, what do those numbers really mean to us in our day-to-day -day life? Like yesterday, this is also going to sound a little bit odd, but yesterday I looked up how many wild pandas are there in the world. Mm. And it said something like there's 1,482 wild pandas in the world. And I was like, oh, okay, that's actually more than I expected, but really, that's it? And somebody went out and took a panda census, and are you sure you got all the pandas? And how do you know you got all the pandas? Oh, because you've been everywhere in the wild, because now you went into the wild to go count something. But then it was talking about how back in the 70s or something, there was only a 1,000 pandas, so this is like a whatever increase in pandas, and this is good. And I'm like, okay, if we're just looking at the percentage increase of how many pandas there are in the wild. Sure, it looks like a success story, but like we're still, like what what does that number now justify? Like what what further expansion or what pat on the back, we're doing a good job, we're not as bad as we think we are, does that justify, you know? And so that to me is completely different than belonging to a place and being in relationship to a place that you call home. Like if I looked up in a newspaper and said, oh, all right, there's, you know, 200 beavers in Edmonton this year, I guess we're not doing too bad, as opposed to walking around Edmonton and looking at, have I seen any beavers this year? And what is the effects on the land? And, you know, it, it's a totally different relationship. And that, that really, I think, has a lot to do with um, Western dominance and supremacy as well, is our way of looking at the world has been applied to this place that we call home, but we're not actually seeing this place that we call home. We're counting things. Yep. We're solidifying stories. We're not listening. You know, we're not we're not looking with our eyes. We're looking on a piece of paper. It's all rational. It's rational thinking dominance. It's Western thinking dominance. And personally, that's something that I've been very interested in in poking at lately. Yeah. Well, the, the first writing I believe in the Middle East. Uh, had to do with with basically counting uh, livestock, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if, perhaps for trade. So it could be that the first writing was basically a receipt, you know, that that's kind of that's kind of where that started, you know. And then yeah. when the printing press came about in Europe and whatever that was, the 1500s, there were people who were like, oh, this is terrible. We're going to lose um, memory. We're going to lose our memory skills, you know. And you can go back and you can read stories about the remarkable memories that people used to have, you know, and there were different uh, devices and methods for remembering things, you know, uh, a famous one has to do with um, picturing a building that you're going into and there's a thing in each room, you know, or an idea in each room. I mean, there were different things like this that, that people used, you know, and so and people were able to remember very long lists of things. They were able to remember, you know, whole stories. I mean, you know, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey were 
were were mm-hmm. were written down after being told, you know, countless yeah. countless times. And and it is a completely different kind of it's a different kind of knowledge. It's a different kind of knowing and it's closer to something and writing down something is taking us farther is taking us farther away. Yeah, it's the age of information, but you know, it's also the age of amnesia. I don't have to remember anything because I can go on Google and, you know, look up the quick answer and take the sound bite and decide, okay, well, my mind's made up on that. Right. And I think that that is, is part of um, the polarization that we're seeing a lot these days is, you know, everyone, <laughs> my favorite, least favorite line in the world is do your research. I cannot stand it. When people write yeah. that, I'm like, okay, so like, what, what are you really saying to somebody? You're, you're, you're disposing of them first off. And secondly, you're telling them to go watch YouTube and assuming that that's a good source of information. <laughs> and then you're saying, hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> I just, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I needed a break there <laughs> for YouTube. It's the source of information. Okay, go on. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, at, at work, we just call it Dr. Google, because, you know, you, and right. I mean, I do it too, like, anytime I'm sick, I'm like, typing my symptoms, oh, God, I have this yeah, terrible, yeah. rare thing. And it's like, no, just settle down, you probably don't. Yeah. But yeah, it's the, it's the whole idea that, you know, well, there's so many things to say about the age of information and disinformation, I actually just got a little blind there in front of my eyes thinking about it, because that whole idea, you know, go do your research. Yeah, first off, it's assuming that what is on the internet is true because somebody wrote it down. So somebody writes something down and it's suddenly true. And then secondly, it's assuming that you have access to that information too. So, you know, you're you're not everybody in the world has access to the internet still. Like it's not it's not a global thing. It's assuming something about um class and ability i guess as well and yeah you can go look something up you can go type in a a address into your map and like you don't have to think anymore and so i was actually just talking with somebody yesterday about how 10 years ago i i didn't text i didn't really use facebook that much or anything i didn't you know the internet was still not the main source of information when i was in school um, we were just learning how to write inf- how to write internet references. And when I was teaching at the university, um, my students would hand in their papers with all these internet references. And I'm like, I don't even know if this is proper APA style because <laughs> I never had to do this. Like that's that's the rate of change lately. It's quite stunning when you think about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't have you don't remember things anymore. And I've noticed in my own attention span and my own short term memory, I've noticed a difference in the last 10 years. And I've been wondering lately, especially during COVID, you know, now that I just have more time on my own, in this environment of constant distraction, as well, before I was distracting myself with social things, I was distracting myself with what I call my own little dramas, that I've, I've had end in the last year. And now I'm, I'm being faced with more of what is actually built in my life. And, you know, I'm also entering the second phase of my life too. So I'm realizing I've got more years behind me than ahead probably. And so also just thinking about, um, yeah, responsibility and, and information going forward. And so I like to learn a lot of things. And I had a friend say to me a little while ago, he's like, you're accumulating all these skills, but what are you going to do with them? And I said, I don't know, because we're not exactly in the kind of environment anymore where people apprentice or where people go and sit and learn from other people. You know, they go to the internet or they go to YouTube to go learn something. Like we don't have lineages anymore of skills. I can go learn to garden on YouTube. I don't have to learn from my grandma. And in some ways, I think that's great where some things have been lost, you know, due to who knows what. But yeah, I really do wonder about this age of information we live in where everything is available to us, but it's all, it all feels very fleeting. It all feels like sound bites. Like we're trying to contend with so much that we're only able to kind of hold on to the immediate sound bites of things. And then we decide that our whole mind is made up on them. And that's yeah. where you get ideology yeah. and rhetoric and, 
and the the disconnect between people that I think actually have more in common than not. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. there's a famous quotation from T.S. Eliot where he said, where is the wisdom that's been lost to, to, to knowledge? Yeah. Where is the knowledge that's been lost to information? Totally. And at this, totally. at this point, he would add, where is the information that's been lost to data? Yeah. Maybe, you know? Yeah. Because we've yeah. broken it down even further now. Yeah. And isn't it and isn't it kind of parallel with the breakdown of, you know, the community to the individual? I mean, you've got the community, you've got the nuclear family, and then you've got the individual. And now you pretty much just have the individual. Yeah. All yeah. of those roles are are encompassed in that one thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's the specialization. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that one way or another, the the system that allows all this to be like this is breaking down. And mm -hmm. it's not going to be with us, you know, forever. It's already changing in so many ways. And I think that um, it is important to be to be building up skills now, you know, mm -hmm. especially skills like gardening, you know, because they're just going to be more and more neat, necessary as time as time goes on, you know? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot lately, too, about the um, perhaps alien feeling need for localized again i struggle with the word community but for lack of a better word localized community um in the sense that i think i know where i am anyways a lot of us have been trying to live so global you know we've been trying to live without limits and projecting our futures into places that don't necessarily ask for us like it's very it was very easy for me to hop on a plane and go wherever I wanted before you know and and that being said like I have I structured my lifestyle to be able to do that I mean I don't have children I don't own property there's things that I haven't partaken in in order to make myself more mobile but now as I think about what's important and what's brought me comfort during this time I'm so thankful to be living with other people right now mm -hmm. you know i i taught my mother how to preserve food <laughs> in the summer oh, that's a skill that i learned on my own because it wasn't passed down to me it skipped a generation and when i look within my own family a lot of the skills and a lot of the um community mindedness skipped a generation in service of becoming that middle class like both my parents grew up not wealthy by any means um, my mother in particular grew up quite poor. But, you know, I, I listened to stories from my father about my papay, my grandfather, his dad, and grand family dinners on Sundays when his mother, um, my great grandmother, would just make a pot and everybody would come and then my papay would play music. And that was the entertainment, you know. And in my generation, it was rare for us to have a family dinner. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I find during these COVID days, you know, I'm, I didn't plan to be living with my parents during these days. I actually turned down a job in British Columbia um, back in June because I couldn't imagine leaving. I couldn't imagine going and living on my own in a place where I don't know a lot of people in a place that didn't ask for me just because I like the scenery like that to me right. isn't that's consumption in itself. You know, that isn't being in relationship to a place. So now I've been thinking a lot about localization and um, what it means to really call a place home. And again, what, you know, if I'm constantly just taking from a place like this place that I live now, Edmonton has given me a lot. I've been very fortunate to grow up here. This place has nurtured me in every way. And in the last year, I've watched a lot of um, my key people leave. They've just moved. You know, one of my friends has a saying that really strikes me these days because he left as well. Um, we say we want community, but we love freedom more. And so I've been thinking a lot about what it means to to be in a place and give back to a place. And I find myself listening a lot more these days than talking. I want to listen to Indigenous people from this area and what they know about this place. I want to listen and be in better relationship. I want to honor the treaties where I am. You know, I want to understand that I'm a guest and what that does as far as my relationship to a place as well as, as far as what that does about my impact on a place and, and perhaps 
my hesitancy to just go do whatever I want, you know? So I really do think about um, this globalized world that has accelerated in my lifetime and going back to, I can't even say going back to, I don't even want to say going back to, because I don't want to get into some, some fantasy nostalgia here about how things used to be and everything was once wonderful once upon a time. I mean, every era has its issues. But when I think about how I want to spend my time and energy in the future, um, I picture a patchwork, like a, a quilt of localities and cultures and people being in relationship to where they are and being in relationship to each other as opposed to just this blanket color across the land of right. one thought monoculture versus, you know, a food forest. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like one thrives and one dies. So Yeah. Yeah, I, I have an indigenous friend in Oregon who looking at the political situation in the United States earlier this year, just in, in, in the election and all the rubbish that was happening, then, you know, said the more I look at politics, he said, the more I feel like, you know, the only way that this nation is going to move in a direction that that's, you know, helpful or productive or sustainable or whatever word it was to use is if there's indigenous leadership, you know, at this point, you know, and I, you know, personally, in, in 2021, I'm, I'm hoping that, that, you know, later on this year, it'll be possible for me to move from from here, you know, and go back up to the Pacific Northwest of, of the US, you know, and work with some of the indigenous people that I know there, because I, I I agree with that. And I feel like that's where the most sensible messages are coming from. That's where the most sensible work is happening. And there's not that same sense of privilege and of oh this is mine there's just i mean among the people i've met anyway you know and, and of course you know indigenous people are, are all very different from each other and some they've all had different experiences etc but you know i feel like i've been fortunate you know to, to meet some people who are interested also in 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 sharing you know uh from whom i can learn and some people i can work with and that really that's really the only thing that makes sense to me at this point you know, there's no future for for where the settler colonial society has gone at this point. I mean, we're reaching the end of the line with it. You know, we've just, yeah. you know, there's there's we, we've chewed up and spit out so much, you know, you know, I mean, it took 500 years or whatever. But like, OK, 95 percent of the yeah. prairies are gone. Ninety five percent of the forests are gone. Ninety five percent of the wetlands are gone. It's like, OK, like this just isn't this isn't this isn't tenable and of course it just feels terrible you know it's not good for anybody no and i think that's the thing is i think you know what we're seeing right now is people are exhausted with it but they're not necessarily able to say this is what i'm exhausted with because it's like right you're in it you can't see outside of it because yeah. you're in it you know and this was gonna come up eventually but yeah <laughs> what is going on in your capital right now oh yeah i you know, I you're, you're talking about I, the uh, the upright the riot that happened on January 6th. I'm just saying this because people might listen to this later months from yeah, now. So that whole thing. I mean, it was interesting because I did not spend the day glued to the media. I went for a walk and, mm -hmm. you know, I had people texting me saying, oh, my gosh, are you seeing what's coming out of the States right now? I'm like, none of this is shocking. I mean, it's it's viscerally shocking to see but it's not surprising right. if you've been paying attention at all and i mean it's it's very easy for me to say as an outsider looking in like oh my gosh you could have seen this coming you know i i don't want to sound um self-righteous in that way because it is it's still insulting to our decency of our dignity like it's it's insulting to everybody's nervous systems i mean i don't see how it couldn't be and it's meant to be but that's the thing is the last four years in particular have been an assault on the senses over yeah. and over and over again and people are exhausted and they're worn down and they don't even know what they're worn down by and i think that that's you know we were talking about pandemic fatigue let's just talk about like fatigue in general with right. you know just the last four years every time that 
I mean, I don't, I don't even live in the States, but every time the radio would come on or the TV would come on, I'm fortunate to be mostly surrounded by people who, when your soon to be defunct leader is gone, like when he would come on the air, we would all just be heckling the TV or telling people to shut it off because they can't even listen to it. Yeah. But the thing about what happened on the 6th of January, um, I, I don't, I don't want people to think that I have any sympathies for what happened. I don't. But what I do see is exhausted people. They just don't even know what they're exhausted by. Right. You know, they don't even know what they're fighting for. Like they're just, I think the one thing that a lot of people, regardless of whatever side you might prescribe to in the moment, subscribe to in the moment, I think something that we have more people have in common than not is an awareness that things are not working and that right. it's not supposed to be like this, you know, right. and regardless of the people storming the Capitol trying to get theirs, <laughs> like that's, that's a different reaction to, I think the acknowledgement that we're something's not right. than people who are, fighting for the land and the water i definitely align more with one side than the other yeah but again when i look at what happened at the capitol on the 6th i see the last breaths of a dying dinosaur mm -hmm. that's my hope anyways yeah but Until. it's you know it's it's disenfranchised people they're just not even sure what they're disenfranchised by and they're also used to having everything their way without question so it does kind of look like a lot of screaming toddlers and again it's people asserting themselves over a place and saying no this is my home without ever actually really giving back to it it's all take it's all you know this is my Hey, are you Did back? I lose you? Yeah, just for a second. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm back. Yeah, it just it just cut off when you were talking about uh, people saying this is mine. Yeah, so just the whole idea of you know this is my land, this is my home, this is my way, this is the way that things should be. Um, there's no humility in it. There's no listening. There's no asking questions. There's just assertion of dominance, and. I think one of the blessings of, of what's been going on these days is um, we've had our freedoms challenged and suddenly, you know, self-centered freedom is not so sexy anymore as right. evidenced by, you know, where I am again, the politicians traveling that kind of freedom, nobody's celebrating it. We're all looking at it going, you're not thinking of the community here. You're not thinking about the larger impact. And so I guess one blessing that I see out of these days is people starting to ask a little bit more, about impact and ask more what it means to be in something together because the messaging that we've been given here is we're we're all in this together has been the the message handed down from our provincial government and we're all sitting here going no we're not no, clearly no. there's like t there's tears of being in this together so i'm in this as long as i don't raise a fuss about what you're doing over there no those days are over <laughs> yeah so well, that's good that those yeah. days are over hopefully i mean we'll yeah. see <laughs> we'll see yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we covered a lot of ground that. today. <laughs> I know. I was thinking, I'm like, that kind of went everywhere, but also stayed within <laughs> the confines of some things. Yeah, it feels like it's always like that when we talk. I yeah. know. It's a little <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> I've also just had a week off work, so I've been in my own head a lot. So I'm having right. a lot of convergence of ideas and I, I definitely appreciate the opportunity to talk through some of them out loud oh, with anyone who'd like to listen definitely definitely yeah no well the, the episodes with you on them have been among the more popular ones you know for That's sure so so, so apparently people do like to to listen yeah yeah I listen to some canadian <laughs> mm -hmm. right right yeah, yeah it, it's really important for people in the united states to listen to people who aren't in the united states you know 
you know, yeah, from basically so. any other country about any topic at any time. Cause like, we're just so insulated here, you know? I guess that that's something that I, uh, I forget about sometimes cause I actually haven't spent that much time in the States. I spent a lot of time in other places that didn't ask for me. Um, I spent time in the Middle East and Eastern and Southern Africa and Central America and South America, but very little in the States. And sometimes I forget that um, not everybody gets out there. Not everybody travels. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah. it's, it's, um, that's another thing I've seen get worse over the last 20 years is less awareness of what's happening overseas. Like uh, people don't, like activists and people on the left don't talk about other countries or U.S. imperialism right. as much as they once did, you know, like it's yeah. just not in the news as much what's happening in other countries. And part of that has to do with the concentration of media ownership that's happened in the United States and the fact that so many so many newsroom jobs have been cut. Like since the year yeah. 2000, something like 40, like we have 40 percent fewer newsroom jobs in the United States now than we did in the year 2000. So 40%, yeah. like, you know, and a lot of places cut their foreign bureaus is what they did, you right. know? So at this point, most news outlets in the United States that do cover any uh, international news at all are doing it. They're, they're picking up stories from the wire services, you know? So you got yeah, AP, and, UPI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Reuters. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting because, um, again, back in... 15 years ago now I can't even do the math on that 2005 ish um that's when I remember the 24 7 news channels coming online and that's when I first heard the term axis of evil right and it was Syria Iran and Iraq and that was during the justification for the Iraq war um and I I remember back then <laughs> I decided to go to Syria because I had heard so much about it on the news and I had also learned so much about it um, from classical art history class, actually. Oh, interesting. Because, yeah, because there's a lot of old ruins there from the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And back then I was 25 and stubborn and I was like, I'm going to go. I want to go see what everybody's talking about. So I went and I was there for almost two weeks, and it's one of my favorite places that I've ever visited. But oh, wow. I became aware um, quickly, not just being on the ground there, but also that was part of a longer trip. Um, I was I was living in a tent for five months for that trip, and I went oh, wow. through Eastern and Southern Africa too. But mm -hmm. I remember being on that trip. And that was during the time that Obama was getting elected as well. That was 2008, 2009. And uh, 2008, it would have been the end of 2008. And I remember watching the news in other countries and realizing that, to be perfectly blunt, the Western media is so full of propaganda, despite, yeah. despite you know, priding themselves on yeah. being unbiased reporting based on the five W's. Well, no. Yeah, no. not at all mm -mm. so i mean i would i would be somewhere where something was going on like for example back then i didn't have a cell phone um i wasn't updating facebook all the time i had a travel blog that i was updating maybe once a week just to mm. let my family know that i was alive mm -hmm. and i was doing that when i could find an internet cafe and a keyboard in english and so uh -huh. it was it was sporadic and i remember I had been offline for a few days and I hopped onto my email and there was like five messages from different relatives and they were all, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, what are they talking about? And so I had been in Jordan. I had been camping in the desert in Jordan and my parents, my family kind of knew the rough itinerary. And by the time I was getting these emails, I must have moved on. I think I was in Egypt by the time I was getting these emails and they were all, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And so my family is sending me these news stories about these people that were kidnapped and they were, you know, it made it sound like they were right where I was in the desert in Jordan. And Oh my God, are you okay? And it must've been you. Like just the whole tone of the articles mm -hmm. was very alarmist. Whereas right. in the country that I was actually in, it was like, yeah, this happened. Here's the other half of the story. And, you know, it's all good, basically. Right. And it was just one of those, those 
moments of realizing how many different ways a single story can be told Mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah, I really do wonder about our exposure here to media. And I'm not sure that social media is much better. I do find some of the uh, accounts as they're happening from regular people on the ground. I find those valuable, but I have to wonder as well um, about censorship with that kind of stuff and if we'll start seeing more censorship yeah i mean they they already have been google and the and the social media have already been using algorithms to downgrade or eliminate you know um different press you know from other countries already you know like there was something today about press tv you know it just it just got kicked off of facebook you know and like you know, Telesur, you know, it was one that got kicked off a while ago. That was, a, um, you know, news from South America that had been put together by Venezuela and some other uh, some other countries. I mean, they just really and they and they and when they're not censoring it, they're downgrading it, you know. And, yeah. and I also just want to note that I think it's perfectly fair to use the word censor when we're talking about what social media and Google are doing. There are people who say, oh, censorship is only when the government does it. And it's like, hmm. You know, no. those are those are private companies. It doesn't count. It's like, well, yeah, but you know, like like Ajamu Baraka made a good point on this one the other day, where he said, "Well, the problem is that our public space has been privatized." You know? Yeah. So, so that is the yeah. only space we have, and so yes, it is it is censorship. You know, and of course, the social media companies are working with the U.S. government as well. You know, basically mm-hmm. saying, "Okay, well, we'll we'll do what you want in regards to certain things," and they're doing that because they don't want antitrust regulations brought against them. You know, right. And so they're willing to like work with the government on deciding what they will show and what they won't show. Well, okay, they're working with the government and for the government. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's censorship. So, so I, you know, t- yeah. ten years ago it was a little bit different. Twenty years ago it was different. But, but, but now that's that's um, that's really just become academic. That one is public yeah. and one is private. It is, it is, it's that's what we're getting is de facto censorship at this point. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, and it, that really kind of that really kind of throws a wrench into the whole idea of uh, freedom and democracy and exporting that overseas for the good of other people. Yeah. Like, you know, when I was in Syria, you you can't get on Facebook in Syria unless you know the backdoor way to get on Facebook in Syria, which everybody knows. And mm-hmm. so, right. I mean, I was still I was still able to find what I needed in Syria, but it was one of those things where you type something into Google and you might only get 20 hits, you know, like what you're, what you're being fed back is it's definitely controlled. But then the idea that, you know, our internet is, is free and open is also a total joke. I mean, if I type something into Google, I'm going to get the top 20 things I see are going to be Western based and Western focused. Like I have to go type in Al Jazeera. If I want to go read something from Al Jazeera, it's not going to come up. I know. Yeah. You know? So yeah, the whole idea that we live in like a, a free open society of some sort of information available to everybody. No, I don't think so. No, no. It, it's an amazing irony that, that, uh, the internet is now so big and so readily accessible from so many points that you can now walk around with it in your pocket. And yet, uh, most people are no better informed than they were before. And I think that in many ways are less informed yeah, I agree. than they were I agree. before. It, it, it hasn't worked for what they said it was going to work for. And it's worked really well for, uh, for selling things to people for commercial interests. This worked really well for that. And for selling ideas. Yeah. And for, <laughs> for selling, selling ideas. ideas. Yep. Yeah. I remember, Mm -hmm. you know, back in 2000, whatever that was, when I was watching too much 24 seven news, um, I dove into the conspiracy theories a little bit and I dove down that dark rabbit hole. And I, I was very much trying to tell everybody around me, like, you're missing it, you're missing it. And I realized now what I was buying for was some, some semblance of control in my life. You know, I was, I was trying to to figure something out like that was going to make me feel better without realizing for me anyways, um, the feel better, if you even want to call it that came from surrender came from the, you know, it was almost a relief off my shoulders. It was a burden off my shoulders to say, I'm not in control. Like I am one person. I am one, 
living being in a world and a universe of trillions of living beings with their own wills and their own forces and their own aims. And that for me was incredibly freeing. And so tying into what's going on in your country right now with the storming of the Capitol and all that too, and the, the ideologies, the ideological split, it seems, um, in your country right now is I, I see very much and I mean not just your country but it's the obvious for, it's right. the obvious example right now it's not to single you guys out by any means but um, I, I see people wanting to assert themselves and wanting to have some kind of semblance of control and I do wonder about intergenerational trauma with that and I, I wonder about amnesia and lack of stories and lack of belonging and individualism and it almost seems like a, a, a loop like it's like a feedback loop, you know, and, and I've been wondering a lot lately about, again, putting down some of that burden of having to be in control and having to be dominant and having to know the answers. And I've been surrendering a lot more to, I don't know, the words, I don't know, and I don't have to know, I'm just one person, we can, let's figure this out together, you know, and let's, let's listen more, not just to other people, but to this land that we call home. And I've noticed that since I've taken that approach, even just within my garden or within my own family, my relationships have changed. Yeah. It's not just me asserting my dominance anymore. And it's a, it's a relief to put down that burden in some sense. So when I see people storming the Capitol, I see them carrying a really big burden <laughs> that, you know, if, if, there was a little bit more humility there and some surrender and some ease. I don't know, but I see that, I see that from both sides. I see even the, the creation of sides as problematic in itself. And again, both sides trying to figure something out as opposed to surrendering to some greater mystery. Yeah. Well, and the definition of those sides is being given to us, you know, from within a really narrow you know, point of view as as well, you know, I mean, yeah. if they're just saying it's the Democrats and the Republicans, well, I mean, that's a very narrow, narrow view of the world in which you're seeing them as different, you know, <laughs> that's very much, that's very much, you know, what I'm, as somebody on the outside, looking in, um, I think that that's been one of the most stunning things to me over the last four years is I, I have quite a few American friends and people that I, I care about quite deeply. And I'm not able to visit with, which is difficult. But yeah. um, over the last four years in particular, you know, there's some friends that I'll talk to and they'll be telling me a story about somebody that they met and they'll say, oh, but he's a Republican or, oh, or my neighbor's a conservative. And it's like, I'm pretty sure my neighbor's a conservative, but it never really occurred to me, you know, and, and that kind of um, wanting to sort and label people into two opposing groups is really troubling to me because again if you look at the grand arc of history when you've got two groups who are convinced the other people are the problem you end up with some pretty bad things happening like i it's hopefully an extreme example but i mean when i was in rwanda you know Mm. I, i went to the genocide memorial there and I actually wasn't expecting to do that on the day that I did go. And so it was a very raw experience and that I didn't have a lot of time to prepare myself for it. And um, I think one of the things that I really took away from that place was the success, the long-term success of the Belgians, I believe believe it was, who really split um, the population into two opposing groups and a smaller group with most of the resources ruling over a larger group with less resources. And if this doesn't sound all too familiar, where you're looking at every individual down the street going, oh, they're a Hutu or, oh, they're a Tutsi. Like, it's, to me, it's the same, it's the same story over and over again, and it never ends well. And the freaky thing about what happened on the 6th, um, for me, was remembering that memorial and if I remember correctly, I might not be remembering this correctly, but I remember being in the memorial and there was uh, something playing over the speakers in one of the rooms and it was, they used the radio to to put these messages out there to basically tell people to go attack. 
their neighbors and they did they used the radio wow. and so i'm looking at what happened on the 6th and i'm like you're using social media like you're using like this is what 30 30 40 years later now 30 right. years later and we're using the latest technology the latest iteration of the mass media technology you know a leader leader i use that word very loosely mm-hmm. just used it to incite a riot and it feels all too familiar to me you've got two opposing groups of people who probably have more in common than not but haven't figured that out yet and they're being incited over impersonal media <laughs> and it, it's very stunning to me and very scary i think the situation is definitely something to take very seriously, you know, for mm-hmm. sure. And I think that um, part of that is going to be, well, we need to take it seriously and then we can't count on the leadership of, of, of the country here to be taking it seriously the way it needs to be taken seriously, you know? Yeah. I mean, what the Democrats are going to do at this point and the Republicans will go along with them because at the moment that it is, is pass some new quote domestic terrorism legislation is what they're going to do, you know? Right. And it's like, well, everything that those people did is already, there's already crimes for that. You know, you've already got trespassing. You've already got making threats. You've already got destruction of property. You've already, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that anyone, if you want to charge those people with crimes, there's a bunch of stuff you can charge them with already. We don't need to make any new laws up for that. And if a new domestic terrorism thing is come is come is, you know law is made, well, we've seen how this works. We know the drill. This will be used on Black Lives Matter protests later this year. It'll be used yeah. on environmental activists. It'll be used on indigenous people. That's what the domestic terrorism law will be used for. Absolutely, the last thing we should do at this point is pass a new law like that, you know? And, and all that is not even get into the idea that should we even have jails, of course, which I don't think yeah. so. And I mean, you know, that, that's a whole other subject. But but yeah, so, the, so, so we do need to take it seriously because the people who went in that building that day, uh, some of them were just going in just to make a ruckus and you know, make a noise. Other people were going in there with the intent of killing people and of kidnapping yeah. people, et cetera, et cetera, you know? And, you know... The thing that I took away from the day mostly in the biggest way was like was how the police let them in, you know, and the police were working with them. It's because, well, yeah, because they're all a bunch of right thing, right wing thugs, really. I mean, and people who have been following protests in Portland, Oregon over the last few years already familiar with this narrative of Mm -hmm. right wing protesters come to have a protest. Cops help them out, you know. Like that story's played out over and over in Portland the last few years because there's really Portland was picked as a target um, for a lot of national right wing organizing in the United States. And they purposely sent people there from, you know, they'd have an event and get people there from all over the country to go the same day, you know, and then there'd be the counter protesters, Antifa, who, who would show up there and then the police would be much harder on Antifa than they were on the right wing protesters, even though everyone was you know, breaking the rules according to what they say the rules are, you know, and, right. you know, I mean, there was an instance there where the the regional bus, uh, regional transportation uh, TriMet uh, actually used some buses to help the right wing protesters get around, you know, so they were actually using public funds there. I mean, wow. OK, so, you know, that that <laughs> I was I was happy to see that the fact that the police are also right-wingers and helped out the the protesters there to get in the building, that that actually did make the press in the United States. I wasn't really expecting it to. I thought they were going to spin us the story of like, oh, they weren't prepared. Oh, we need to give them more money because they weren't. Well, actually, so in that sense, the, the, the police overplayed their hand. They actually got caught this time. They don't usually get caught. So that was good that they got caught. And that part of it where the cops were, where the bad guys too in this situation, that's the part that we need to hold on to and keep holding up over and over again and being like, nope, look, 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 here's what happened. You know? Yeah. We all know that if it was any other kind of protester, they would never have made it in the building. They got in right. because, you know, and, and so, yeah, we need to, you know, basically go through the police with a fine tooth comb and get all the Nazis out. 
that's what we need to do at this point, you know, and and there'll be a lot fewer cops right at first because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of white supremacists in the police force in the United States, in part because it came out of the slave patrols, etc. I mean, it's it's the history of it. You know, it was it was always uh, um, white people going after black people that led to the formation of the police. I mean, it's in the it's in the DNA. So, you know, that's something that we need to take seriously and hold up and not let go of. And, you know, if there's anything we can do to to try to prevent that legislation or protest that we also need to do that, the domestic terrorism stuff, because that's, that's not good. No, well, and I, I guess too, you know, that just, again, kind of opens up the, the grand overview of what it means to be um, governed as opposed to what it means to be led. Right. And they're not the same thing. And right. then also looking at that whole uh, idea of human cons- consumption, like, you know, somebody does something bad, you toss them away in jail, as opposed to right. to looking at the, the larger structure of things. And that, I mean, that's got roots in Western psychology, too, where, again, the individual is the focus. It's not focusing on, and even then, it's only one part of the individual. Like so, rarely does Western psychology focus on the spiritual aspects or the the ecological aspects right. of of the human life. But yeah, I hear you, and it's the whole idea of let's just make a law, like let's just legalize or illegal or make things illegal as the answer to things. It's again, it it feels like more of that assertion of dominance as opposed to relationship. <laughs> like it's, yeah. yeah, and I guess too, like that's again where I start wondering more about um, dealing with things locally as opposed to having some kind of national, you know, government structure that's trying to impose itself on the life of three hundred and sixty ish million people now like you're not you're not all living the same reality like people on the east coast aren't living the same reality as people on the west coast no they're not so how do you have any chance of being heard how do you have any chance of like again it's it's government governance versus leadership right and yeah i don't know a lot of what i'm thinking about these days in relation to any kind of future or even present or you know how i want to be as i walk this earth um it focuses on on yeah the local and relationships i always say the future is relational in that you know we might not have good models our generations might not have good models for how to be with one another anymore but i think we have to try and i think that the ones coming up behind us they're going to learn from our mistakes hopefully so i have a lot of questions about i know there's where i am anyways there seems to be a a run to um intentional communities and that kind of thing and i've been very resistant to that actually i don't i don't plan on staying in the city forever but i'm okay here for now but i'm resistant of intentional communities just being formed out of fear and reaction really to what's going on because if you were brought up in a system where punishment was the way of dealing with, with conflict and you think you're going to go do something differently, like based on what you don't have practice with that. And you get a group of people together who don't have practice with that and don't have models with that. You don't have elders for that. You know, you're, it's the blind leading the blind and hopefully you've got people, young people in the community as well who are learning from this and who can hopefully do a better job the next generation. The blind leading the blind describes many of the attempts at intentional communities I've seen. Yeah, me too. And how I've seen them fall apart. Yeah. Well. Yeah, I don't have much confidence in them no. at this point unless unless they're they're rooted in, in, in some way are taking their taking their um lead in some way from indigenous values or people. I think that that's yeah. what it comes back to over and over and over again at this point is that we just have to we have we, we must We've got to stop looking to our own our own traditions and uh, at this point and look look outside of them. It hasn't worked. Our our culture no. has brought us to uh, an ecological dead end. You know. Yeah. It, it's this is a failed experiment. Yeah. 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 And I'm I'm careful too about my relationship with uh, indigenous communities as well because again I don't want to just be on the take. You know, like 
people that look like me have done a lot of damage to the right. indigenous communities. And I, I know a lot of people, individual families and communities are still healing from that. And as evidenced by what happened on January 6th, like people who look like you and me, we've got people to deal with too, before we can get to a place of, yeah. of listening and not consuming and not commodi- commodifying indigenous knowledge as well. I'm very careful about that. But um, I think I mentioned on my social media, I don't know if you saw it, and I'm, I'm totally plugging it on your show right now to anybody <laughs> who's listening. It's fine. But <laughs> there's, a, there's a course at the University of Alberta. Um, it's called Indigenous Canada, and it's free. And it's free, I think, to people in the States, too. I'm pretty sure that you can take it. And it, it is focused on Indigenous Canada, but really our histories are fairly yeah. tied in together. Mm-hmm. Um, and it definitely has a bit of a leaning towards Indigenous people in Western Canada, but they did touch on the East as well. And I appreciated it in that it didn't fall into a lot of pan into I can never say this word, pan indigeneity. <laughs> right. In that it's, you know, it is it is respecting that there's over five hundred nations just in Canada. Like they're not they're not all the same thing. Oh, I didn't know that many in Canada. Oh wow. yeah, there's there's quite a few. I think there's or maybe it's five hundred or so in the States. Either way, there's hundreds in both of our countries of yeah. sovereign nations and groups of people. And so I appreciated that it didn't just paint everybody with the same picture and I got into different creation stories and storytelling and stuff like that. But nice. I highly, highly recommend that course to anybody who's interested in it. It's told from an indigenous point of view. Um, I thought it was really well done and I oh, thought cool. it was a good intro into more truthful relations on this land that we call home because I know where I am. They don't teach us a lot of that in school. Right. You know, and as far as as helping people understand um, a lot of the activism issues that I'm seeing in Canada anyways these days. And I I know somewhere in the States, too, there's been some land back things going on. Like, wasn't a big Mm -hmm. swath of Oklahoma just given back, I think, or was it Ohio? I don't remember. Not given back, per se, but there was a judge that decreed that it was more theirs than we've been treating it as. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was acknowledged that it was not seated yeah. properly. Um, yeah, I, I know that for my own learning and stuff, it, it really kind of opened my worldview quite a bit as opposed, to, you know, just relating to where I am anyways. But yeah, it's open to anybody who wants to take it. So cool. Well, I can, you can it. send me the URL. I can put a link in the, I'll in the show notes. I'll send you the link, right? yeah. well, for sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, we covered a lot of stuff. <laughs> Maybe that's a good place to end it. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace. Now, now, what about Sasha? Did we get to see Sasha for a moment? Hold on. Yes, I'll get her. Hi, Pop. Come here. Oh. <laughs> With a tie-dyed shirt. With a tie-dyed shirt. Yeah, it's actually unseasonably warm here right now so she's in t-shirts not in sweaters but oh my it was goodness her birthday yesterday oh happy birthday she's, sasha i know she's an eight-year-old girl now oh wow <laughs> so we've been together for six and a half years and she's gotten me through divorce and now a pandemic and she's my she's my study buddy in school these days and it's her and i in 100 square feet and we're just fine that's great <laughs>